Tradoom. Blue is cheap.
research is required. It's why paleontology is such an exciting science. It's like we're always learning new things all the time. To mount the skeleton. Um, really, really cool. Well, welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. <laughs> Out of the potato, thank you for the three months of support. I really appreciate it. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's, uh, it's really good to have all of you here right now. How is everybody doing? <clears throat> Sorry, I got something in my eye. Ugh, oh, eyelash. Um, welcome to Paleontologizing. As you can tell, this is a live broadcast. <laughs> and I'm glad you're here. Um, if it's your very first time here, then an extra special welcome to you. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. You know, talking to folks about science. As a dinosaur paleontologist, I'm, uh, well, you know already, a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. That's why I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Um, and when I say I work on dinosaurs, I mean that I study dinosaurs, I publish on dinosaurs in the scientific literature, and uh, I dig up dinosaurs. During the summer, I was digging in Wyoming and Utah this past summer, and uh, dug up at least three new species of dinosaurs, and we live-streamed all three of them, and more. Uh, live streaming is how I make my living nowadays. We're going to be talking a bit about science funding today, so... Bigger discussion on that later, but yeah, sometimes money is really hard to come by in science. This is actually how I make my living. This is how I put food on my table through, uh, through these live streams that I do five days a week, every weekday, right here on Twitch kind of wonderful. I'm able to get two birds stoned at once that way. You know, talking about fossils, doing outreach, and you know, getting money for it at the same time. That's uh, it's kind of a dream come true, so thank you to all of the supporters out there. All of you subscribers and cheerers and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, on uh, today's episode of Paleontologizing, we're going to be talking about a little tiny bit about the nation of Lesotho in southern Africa, and we'll talk about some dinosaurs from there because it is Lesotho's national day today, October 4th. But October 4th also marks another important anniversary, the launch of Sputnik 1. Sputnik, or Sputnik as most people call it here in the States, was a Soviet satellite, the first ever artificial satellite to be put into Earth orbit. Um, we'll be talking about that. Its influence on science, especially here in the United States, and its impact that is even felt to this day. Should be a fun discussion. So I'm glad you're here. We're getting into some, uh... Some real, like, science in the real world kinds of stuff today. So I hope you're ready for it. Anyway, before we get into any of that, let me scroll up to the top of chat and say hello to everybody. And we'll see who has joined us today so far. Science Streams was first today. How are you doing, Balint? It's good to see you. I hope all is well. Uh, go for Fluffernut. How are you doing, Fluff? Welcome, welcome. Grim Deviant, was shaking with you. Glad you could be here today. Uh, C. Mark Lev, how are you doing, C. Mark? Welcome, welcome. Uh, Paleontologist VA. Abstract book is that? Oh yeah, for SVP. We're not really supposed to share that online though, from what I understand. Um. Yeah, but anyway, cool. Have you got an abstract in there? It looks like it. Poster. Oh, very cool. Very, very cool. Well, thanks for sharing. Everybody check out the uh, the Discord if you want to see that, I guess. Neat. Very neat. Uh, yeah, I've got a talk at SVP this year too, but it'll be in the virtual meeting after the conference because it's going to be at TwitchCon during actual SVP. 
weekend. Out of all 52 weekends out of the year, they had to make it on the same one. Anyway, uh, Kodali, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Good to see you. Cephalon Wolf, glad you could make it today. Matt M33, Tradoon to you too. Howdy, howdy. Tommy Platicus, I hope you're doing well. It's good to see you here in chat. Dr. Irrefutable, hello to you too. Uh, Gnilf, Gnilf, how are you doing? Glad you could make time today. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Uh, Thalo, what's shaking with you? I'm glad you are here also. And sysadmin, your computer is fixed. I'm glad to hear it. Welcome back, sysadmin. Welcome back. Over it already. How are you doing? Thanks for returning. It's good to have you here. Uh, and Espy says, hey, that's us, in reference to the those hominids there in, uh, in that cold open video. I'm glad you enjoyed that, Espy. Truckhorn, how are you doing? Welcome. Welcome. Uh, Lunisaurus, what's shaking with you? It's good to have you here. Cactus Jack, hello, hello. How are things going for you today? Trappy Jenkins is bringing the science here. How you doing, Trappy? Welcome. And, uh, we should do Displetosaurus today, shouldn't we? Yeah. Um. We were going to do it yesterday, and it slipped my mind. And I had some emails and stuff to send out, so I had to kind of split early. You know what, if you give me some time tomorrow, SB, we'll we'll do a special Despletosaurus deep deep dive. Cause we've got three species of Despletosaurus now, and I want to cover all of them. Including the new one that was just published by some of my colleagues. My old roommate. The new species of Despletosaurus is named after him. So if you'll be here tomorrow, then we could do it then, SB, and I'll make sure it gets its due attention. Maybe we'll even do it today if you're still around and uh, we have an opportunity. We'll see. Live broadcast. Who knows what could happen? Uh, and. But yeah, yeah. And let's see here. Science Outreach, the awesome dream. Yeah, Belint, you're. As. Uh, as Neil says, you're living that dream right now. If anybody here is not yet following Science Streams, oh boy, you're missing out. I know we raid into Science Streams with some regularity, but if you've never been here for one of those raids, well, you're going to get an opportunity to meet Belint of Science Streams. Well, at TwitchCon, if you'll be there, but prior to that, we are going to be doing a special interview. Whoop. Not with me. Afuera. There we go. A uh, special interview with Belint on Tuesday the 10th. Yeah, that is going to be a ton of fun. So I hope... I hope... You can be there for that. Yeah. So excited and nervous... Blint, the reason I asked you to be my first interviewee is because I would be the least nervous about it, because I know you know what you're doing, and you'll be patient if we have technical difficulties, and you have a phenomenal stream yourself, and uh, you know how this sort of thing works. So how could it be anybody else for my first interview but, uh, but you? Yeah. Scared to speak to my science here. We've spoken many times on the phone, Blint. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to it. I'll... Got so many things going on, but maybe I can draft you up a list of questions or something, or... I don't know. We'll see. But everybody, tune in for that next Tuesday. Tuesday the 10th of October. Interview with, uh, with Blint. It will be epic, Neil. It'll be really cool. And we'll be talking at least a little bit about the... Uh, our upcoming panel discussion at TwitchCon, which is going to be a ton of fun. And just be loosey-goosey. That sounds good. That sounds good, Valent. Yeah. Done for whatever. Thank you again, my good sir. You don't have to call me sir, Valent. Holy cow. Uh, I appreciate you. And Matt, I'm 33. They have Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that very much. I really do. 
Thank you, thank you. We are... I don't know if we're going to get our sub goal this week. We'll see. But, uh, we'll see. Yeah. We got so many last week that I'm not super worried about it. I'll still be able to make ends meet, I think. Hmm. Anywho. And good afternoon to you too, Tatum. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's good to have all of you here. Thank you again for, uh... Now, before we get into our Sputnik discussion, we are going to talk about the nation of Lesotho. The kingdom of Lesotho. They have a king? That's... Okay, that's interesting. But Lesotho has their national day today. It's a wonderful opportunity to talk about their fossil heritage. Lesotho is a country in southern Africa. You could also say it's a country in South Africa because it is one of those countries that is entirely within the borders of another country. So there is Lesotho there within South Africa. It is a beautiful country from what I understand. see if we can find a quick little, like, Visit Lesotho video. Here, this is less than two minutes long. Let's take a look at this. And let's unmute the site. And let's play our own music. There we go. Lots of interesting topography in this country. Just like with South Africa. I'm sure you've got, this is probably like a plate margin. You've probably got some plate boundaries there. So you've got like a subduction zone and mountain building and yeah. Anyway, a beautiful country. Look at that. There are some dinosaurs that are known from Lesotho, which is why we're talking about it right now. On Lesotho's National Day. Can anybody tell me a dinosaur which is known from the nation of Lesotho. Hmm. Might seem like a tricky question. I promise it's not as tricky as it seems. A dinosaur from Lesotho. Hmm. Don't overthink it, chat. Don't overthink it. Uh... Come on. If you answered Lesotosaurus, like Thalo did, you were correct. Lesotosaurus is probably the most well-known dinosaur from Lesotho. But, um... Mercotenos. Is that... Is that one balloon? I'm actually not totally sure. I think Heterodontosaurus might also be from Lesotho as well. Only Saurus. Yes. Um, Lesothosaurus is the one that I was looking for. It should be the one that springs to mind. And, uh... Well, shoot. Lesothosaurus, let's talk about it, shall we? Here's... Here's a pro tip, chat. Uh, do not get your science information 
unvarnished from YouTube shorts, or you'll end up with stuff like this. You look up Lesotosaurus, the first result on YouTube is a YouTube short, which is basically like YouTube's way of competing with TikTok. Um, they're like really short videos like this. And this one is entitled Lesotho, the country, is named after the largest reptile on Earth. Hashtag shorts. That's completely one million percent incorrect. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Nonsense. This dinosaur, the Whoop. largest ever reptile on Earth. It was an omnivorous dinosaur, which evolved. So, first of all, it's showing a sauropod, which is completely the wrong group of dinosaurs entirely. And then they say it's omnivorous. I wonder if this is just something they got from, like, ChatGPT, or if this is AI-generated or something like this. But yeah, they, it's dog water. Just garbage. Garbage. In the early Jurassic period. Lesotho is named after the Leosthosaurus dinosaur, the largest ever reptile on Earth. Completely false. Let me introduce you to the Sotosaurus. The Sotosaurus is a little ornithischian dinosaur. Not much bigger than, say, a chicken. So, no, it is not the largest ever reptile on Earth. It's, uh, it's a pretty small critter, actually. Yeah. It may not have... In fact, this, they probably got a little bit bigger than this. This is probably not full grown. But, uh... Yeah. And... Here, we've got a little video with, uh... With Scott Sampson here. Here, kids. Let's take a look at uh, this dinosaur train clip. Hi there. I'm Dr. Scott the Paleontologist. Hi, Dr. Scott the Paleontologist. I'm... I'm just plain Danny, the paleontologist. Lesotosaurus. I don't see a dinosaur. Oh, this dinosaur is using camouflage. What's camouflage? Well, an animal is camouflage when it blends in with its surroundings. To it's hide. way bigger than life size here. There, now can you see the dinosaur? We don't know. Where? You see it, chat? No, it's, it's, it's like Dora the Explorer. Where's the dinosaur? Well, for anyway. Sure, if Lesotosaurus had camouflage coloring, yeah, we don't know that. Dinosaurs must have. Lots of animals living today use camouflage either to hide from predators or to hide when they're hunting. Yeah, in fact, it stands to reason that the number of animals today that have camouflage. Probably higher than we think. Oh, have a moment Wheel 6 2. Really, You're interrupting my joke, but that's okay. No, what blue is cheap. Love this channel. <laughs> I appreciate The feeling's mutual there, Wheel 6 2. Thank you for the three months of support. I really appreciate you. Um, I was just making a bad joke. Um, yeah, lots of animals have, have camouflage today. In fact, we probably undercount them. Because they're hard to see. Um, yeah. Can you find the polar bear in this picture? He's not a polar bear. It's right here. There's the polar bear. Mm. Right. Well, oh, you're good, Will. I appreciate you. <laughs> I think it's under this thing. I see it. There's the butterfly. That's it. Okay, last one. Can you find the frog? Can you find the leaves? I think they're behind this frog. In this picture. Anyway, Liz, this there's not very much information about Lesotosaurus slash Lesotosaurus in here. Oh, now the kids are using camouflage. Okay, keep watching for more dinosaur discoveries. That's funny. This almost looks like a concept sketch that they have here. Um, do you see the lines right there and the kind of like... Yeah, it really does look like concept art that they used for the final video, which is interesting. Will 6-2, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you for those five gift subs. You just changed things with those five gift subs. I appreciate that very much, Will. Thank you, thank you for contributing to our sub goal this week. Thank you for your support. There's now five people in chat. 
We won't have to worry about any ads for the next 30 days. Uninterrupted science content. Thank you, Will. Appreciate you. So, Lacetosaurus. Let's go back to, to David Norman's Dinosaur Encyclopedia. Uh, book that, like, was a humongous part of my childhood. As you can tell, it's very well loved. And... Yeah. Um, excellent. Excellent book. In fact, let me take this opportunity to... We're trying a new light lighting setup today. And I'm noticing it's a little too yellow here. So I'm holding this up and That's better. That's much better. Good. Nice. All right, good. Um, and you're good, Lenina. Hey, welcome back. It's good to see you, Lenina. This book was a humongous part of my childhood. And uh, this may be one of the first places that I was ever introduced to Lesutosaurus. There we go. In the Fabrosaurs and Heterodontosaurids. Lesutosaurus is right there, running, running there. This is sometimes what we call a speedo. It's an acronym for small-bodied early diverging ornithischian. This group of dinosaurs is actually still fairly mysterious. In fact, it's probably it's not actually a group in a true taxonomic sense. Little two-legged plant-eating dinosaurs with beaks. They're not actually super closely related to one another. Um, but anyway, this is one of the earlier ones from the early Jurassic period. From the nation of Lesotho. Lesotho? 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 I've heard it pronounced different ways. Captain says, this small 35-inch or 90-centimeter long early ornithopod, might not actually be an ornithopod, was a lightly built bipedal form that could probably have run fast in order to avoid predators. Lesutosaurus had strong arms, which it might have used to gather vegetation or to pull branches down to its mouth. It had numerous serrated teeth, which were well spaced out in the slender jaws. The teeth would have been useful in chopping tough leaves, but Fabrosaurs, Fabrosaurs, might not be a real natural group. Uh, they did not have cheek pouches as later ornithopods did. That's also been called into question, too. I've talked to some researchers who think that these guys did have cheeks. But, uh... Yeah. I've got a skull from this little animal. Lesotosaurus. Lesotosaurus. 3D printed. Let me go grab it. And here we are. This is my 3D printed life-size... Lesotosaurus skull. It's, uh... I still have yet to smooth it and paint it. But, to me, this skull just shouts out, I'm a juvenile! I'm immature! Because look at the size of those orbits right there. Huge, huge eye sockets. This is probably an immature animal. Yeah... Kieran says, so a cross between a hamster and a pigeon? Uh, no, it's a dinosaur. Um, the animals that, that I often hear these compared to in terms of their ecology, in terms of like what they're doing in their ecosystem, is actually uh, like a gazelle or a deer, or something like that. These are probably browsing animals. They don't really have teeth for grazing, so they're probably a little bit more selective with what they're eating. They're kind of like a deer, or maybe a gazelle. Um, and they would, uh... Their primary means of defense is vigilus, vigilance and speed, so they would spot predators from far away, 
or hear them or smell them. Probably spot them if the eyes are this big. And, uh, and then run away from them. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Maybe giant squids are all juveniles as well. Mayor space. We have juvenile giant squid, though. Anyway. Oh, I see what you mean about the big eyes. Well, cephalopods are a little different there. But, um... There have been other smallish plant-eating dinosaurs discovered in the same area. Which may just be adults of the same taxon. Oh, there's the original skull right there. From which this model is reconstructed. Yeah. Really good preservation, actually. But just a little bit incomplete. We've got multiple specimens of this animal. Skull and dentition. There's actually a lovely, lovely diagram that shows all the different skull bones. Beautiful. That's that's really nice, actually. We'll be talking all about skulls and the different bones in them and what different skulls evolved for. Uh, different skull morphologies. We'll be talking about that later on in the month. Check out the schedule for that. For Halloween, we're going to talk, be talking about all about skulls. Uh, Postcrania. This is a good article in Lesotosaurus. I'm impressed. Yeah. Let's see. Um... For ontogeny... So, Fabrosaurus is probably the same dinosaur as Lesotosaurus. Uh, but there's another kind of larger ornithischian, slightly larger, that was found in the same formation. And that very well might just be a mature Lesotosaurus. Which would make a lot of sense. Where was that? Looking for that here. Or no, maybe it was Heterodontosaurus that I was thinking of? Shoot. Anyway, Fabrosaurus and Lesotosaurus, probably the same animal. Um, I wonder if we look up Fabrosaurus on Wikipedia, if it just redirects here. Fabrosaurus. Some claim the fossils represent the simple variation of Lesotosaurus, which regarded as a valid which is regarded as a valid taxon. There you go. Anyway, yeah. Lesotosaurus from the nation of Lesotho. It is from both South Africa and Lesotho. Lesotosaurus is. And do we have an article on, say, fossils of Paleontology in Lesotho? Shoot, a Brictosaurus? Which it's probably the same animal as Heterodontosaurus is from there. Ignavusaurus. And that's about it, I suppose. Eus oh, Euskelosaurus. The good leg lizard. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, dinosaurs care not for future arbitrary borders. I know. It's Lesotho's national day today, which is why we're talking about Lesotho today of all days. Uh, uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. Basal sauropodomorph dinosaur from Lesotho. Nice. And a Brictosaurus, too. So at this time, dinosaurs were all fairly small. You don't have any super giant dinosaurs at this point. This is still really, really early in the history of dinosaurs. The early Jurassic period. 
This is toward the beginning of the reign of the dinosaurs. Uh, this is when they're, they're first kind of taken over the Earth. And then later in the middle and late Jurassic, they get, some of them get super gigantic. But many of them, especially these guys, small, small two-legged beaky plant-eating dinosaurs, what we sometimes call speedos, like I talked about. These guys, uh, they exist for the entire reign of the dinosaurs. You've always got little two-legged beaky fast-running plant-eating dinosaurs. It's just a body plan that works, and that's why these guys evolve again and again. Not all of them are related to one another. It's just this body plan that the different Ornithischian dinosaurs adopt again and again. It's pretty cool how that works. Yeah. Uh, anywho. Uh, but Cryo Gagent, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's true that dinosaurs care not for future arbitrary borders. Yep. Yeah. And question, why are so many ammonites opalescent, even though they contain no opal? Because uh, it's it's not opal, it's um, whatever the technical term is for mother of pearl. So... Uh, if we have any mollusk experts in the chat, they would know it off the top of their heads, I'm sure. Um... Yeah, there we go. So we get this kind of like iridescence in ammonites. Ammonites are, of course, these coiled, shelly cephalopods. But that is the original, like, mother of pearl material there. Uh, not, not right? Is that right? Hmm. Let's look up mother of pearl real quick. Yeah, there you go. Apparently it's pronounced Nacre. Okay. Also known as Mother of Pearl. is an organic, inorganic composite material produced by some mollusks as an inner shell layer. It's also the material of which pearls are composed. It is strong, resilient, and iridescent. So yeah, that looks like it's from abalone right there, which is another mollusk. There's the microscopic structure. Okay. It's funny, those lines look pretty randomized to me, but maybe to a chemist, this holds information that I'm not privy to. But yeah, cool stuff. So when you see that kind of thing, like a, uh... an ammonite that's got that iridescent sheen to it, what you're seeing is the original material, the original mother of pearl material that that creature, the ammonite, secreted during its lifetime. It's pretty neat, right? Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. I hope you do too. And we had another question earlier as well. And uh, Cryogagent says that's the biopolymer that holds the nacre la layers together. Oh, neat. Okay. Um, oh, we had a question about if any dinosaurs ever got cancer. The answer is yes. Um, yeah. Uh, I think Lenina already answered this in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Lenina. But check this out. Canadian researchers say they've identified the first confirmed case of advanced cancer in a dinosaur. I think it's about 10 years Evidence ago. This comes from a broken fibula, a leg bone that once supported a centrosaurus. And that's not centrosaurus right there. They've got the wrong ceratopsian dinosaur. Centrosaurus looks like this. Centrosaurus. It is one of the best-known dinosaurs on Earth. Um, we've got more specimens of Centrosaurus than almost any other dinosaur. There's an enormous bone, bone bed of these animals up in Alberta, I think in Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, Canada. Um, yeah, it is a very cool animal. 
Centrosaurus. It's especially cool because we can do so much cool science on it. And we've got enough specimens that weird ones pop up like one that had cancer. Two-ton plant-eating dinosaur that lived 76... That's Triceratops there. And that's a terrible Triceratops. What's wrong with that? Uh, Cryogaijin, thank you for the follow. Cryogaijin, appreciate you. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Um... And was discovered in Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta in 19... Bingo, what'd I tell you? Researchers always thought the bone was healing from a fracture, but findings published in the medical journal, The Lancet Oncology, revealed huh. the dinosaur suffered That's from a big osteosarcoma, journal. the same aggressive cancer that afflicted Terry Fox. Hmm. Osteosarcoma is, a, is what's called a primary malignant bone cancer. What that means, it's a primary bone cancer, meaning that it starts in the bone. And it's a malignant cancer, meaning that it can spread to other parts of the body and have very devastating consequences, including amputation or eventually death in patients. The Oof. bone was cast and CT scanned before a thin slice was studied under the microscope. Very cool. Reconstruction Look at that. Tools were so the yellow part is the cancerous mass on that fibula. So a fibula should be kind of long and straight and narrow, long and thin. The fibula is one of the shin bones. It's the one on the side of the tibia. It's kind of auxiliary to the tibia. And, uh... This is Laura Dern at Jurassic Park. Digging up dinosaurs is hard, frustrating work. It takes months or years, so leave it to the professionals. Uh, do I live? Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. We're used to visualize the progression of the cancer. It's believed the dinosaur had the tumor for a long time, although it likely did not die of cancer. Yep. A similar I think because... That bone, along with thousands of other Centrosaurus bones, all came from that bone. But we talked about this the other day. Um, that's one line of evidence that, that shows that these were probably very social animals. They probably lived in big groups for at least part of the year. Uh, yeah. A bunch of these animals probably died crossing a river. Um, Here's some objects. Gorgeous, gargantuans, and authentic. Yep. Because though they died out so long ago, their fossil bones remain, so we know just what they were like, and can even sculpt them into still, or rather, extinct life. Rosanne, thank you for the 18 months of support. I appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. Uh... So here we go. Yeah, this is a beautiful illustration of this. Much like... Gigantic dinosaurs attacking our boy! A dinosaur? What? Uh, Cobrakey, what? Thank you for the follow. It's good to have you here. Uh, uh, I had this book when I was a kid. This is like a National Geographic dinosaur book. Um, anyway. In the modern day... Oh, there's a bunch of drowned wildebeest there. Oof. You get these massive herds of ungulates, hoofed mammals, like wildebeest. And when they're migrating across the landscape, they'll have to cross a river. We think these dinosaurs were doing the same thing, and sometimes stuff goes wrong. Uh, some of the critters get run over by other ones. They get trampled in the process. It's, uh, it's not great for them, but holy cow, is it good for us as paleontologists? Because there are just thousands of these animals that all got preserved in the same place. And so this dinosaur, I'm pretty sure this individual uh, was from that kind of assemblage. I think it was from the big Centrosaurus bone bed there. And uh, so it did not die of cancer. It drowned, most likely. So yeah, yeah. Ken, how are you doing? Welcome back. It's good to see you. Uh, and Dinosaur Dave, what's shaking? I hope your workday's going well. It's good to see you. A tumor left untreated in a person would be fatal. Researchers say by establishing the links between humans and diseases of the past, it can pave the way in understanding the evolution of one of the most feared diseases in human history, cancer. Emanuela yep. Campanella, Global News. So that's really interesting, the idea that if we can understand how cancer works in, say, a dinosaur, that might give us further insight and to how cancer works in all kinds of different organisms, including humans. So yeah, 
Yeah, why study dinosaurs, people sometimes ask me? Well, A, it's because dinosaurs are cool, and why not? But B, there's always weird spin-off discoveries that you could never expect that happen when you're, uh, when you're doing science. I'm not going to say that paleontology is going to cure cancer or anything like that, but you never know what kinds of insights might arise when you're uh, kind of attacking problems from different angles with different lines of evidence. Yeah. Um, farm in central New York State, and the fossils would have been... Most of the stuff in New York State is Triassic or earlier... Or it's super recent, like Pleistocene, Cryogygian. Um, little marine fossils. Those are probably like Ordovician, I would guess. Yeah. Karen says, I never thought about dinosaurs as herd animals, really. Well, shoot. Most dinosaurs were probably very social. Much more so than modern mammals. Um, I've got reasons for saying this. I'll... Here, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, yeah, so the Ordovician period. You'd have all kinds of cool shelly critters swimming around from giant orthocones like that to bryozoans and trilobites and uh, even some early jawless fishes like these. Um, yeah, the Ordovician was a cool time. Yeah. Anyway. Neat stuff. Neat stuff. And Ordovician was your guess, too? Yeah, good guess. I've heard of a lot of trilobites coming from upstate New York. Um... But, I I don't know. The, the cool thing is, you can actually figure this out yourself. You can find the, the geologic maps from your state. Um, yeah. From the United States Geological Survey. Are there geologic maps or publications for where I live? Uh, detailed geologic mapping has not been completed for the entire United States, but maps are available for most locations. And if you're diligent about it, you can probably track down the maps for your particular area. Uh, the USGS Publications Warehouse lists all published USGS, United States Geological Survey, geologic maps. Here's a link to this. Yeah... Um, and Tony is my baby, says, I live close to the falls of the Ohio with Devonian Rock. There you go. Very cool. Yeah. And, uh, I wonder if anybody's made a video on how to read a geologic map that I could share with you. Let's try this right here. Hmm. The first step to reading a geologic map is to look for the maps. This would be a table or a list explaining colors and symbols used to represent geologic features on the map. Yeah. The map key lists geologic rock units from youngest to oldest. And uh, Kennedy says, are tax dollars at work? This is where I think your tax dollars work the hardest sometimes is in doing stuff like geologic mapping. Because if you don't understand the underlying geology in a given area, you don't understand that area. You know? If you really want to understand it, you got to understand the geology. Whether that's to build a structure on it, like a building or a bridge, you don't want those things collapsing. You know? you got to make sure that you're not building it over like an active fault or something like that. Because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Cryo, thank you very much for subscribing. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to the community. Holy cow, thank you, thank you for that pledge of ongoing support. I will do my best to live up to that. Um, thank you, thank you.
Yeah. Uh, anyway, geology is extraordinarily important. And so state geological surveys do really important work. Often they are grievously underfunded. But shoot, every money that... Uh, every money. Every dollar that goes into funding a geological survey, you probably get $10 out of it in the long run. And Cryo, thank you for those five gift subs there. Thank you kindly. I really, really appreciate that. Look, we're inching closer to our sub goal for the week. There's five people who I'm sure are very grateful. They don't have to watch any ads at all for the next month. Cryo, thank you very much. Ads do suck sometimes. Thank you for, thank you for being part of the solution there. Appreciate you, Cryo. I appreciate you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's get back to this. Each rock unit will have a name, an age, and a short description of its features. Yeah. Each map unit is also identified by a unique symbol. The first nice. letter of these symbols is capitalized and denotes the age of the unit, while subsequent lowercase letters identify the name of the map unit. For example, <laughs> The symbol TRBK is shorthand for the Triassic, Triassic. TR. Brooklyn. Triassic period, not Triassic age. Triassic period. Conglomerate, limestone, and minor volcanics deposited about 240 million years ago. Nice. And so you'll see this on the map. There'll be all these colored little the map key splotches on there. Lines and symbols on the map. Yeah, so we're not worried so much about that as we are about the age. And, uh... Yeah. Here, maybe this one will have something good. Very colorful. There we go. So that's what a geologic map will look like. So this will show you what age the rocks are. Each different color represents a different time. And the thing is, these colors are more or less universal. So if you see kind of a... Like an olive green or something. Oh, like we have right here. K.
Yeah, geologic maps are important to understand. They are, uh... They're pretty cool. Let's see, none of the rest of these are jumping to the top, but... How geologists make geological maps. How to read a geologic map. It doesn't look like a... A kind of, like, big budget video has ever been made on this. How to interpret geologic maps. Here, let's take a look at this. Maybe this will be decent. Welcome to County Office, your complete guide to local government services and public records. Let's start learning. Is this AI generated too? Oh boy. Well, let's see. How to interpret geological maps. Geological maps. Uh, no, thank you. That's AI garbage. Um. Anyway. And Cryo says, I use geological maps in my rock, rock hounding here in Oregon. I collect petrified wood, most of which goes to OSU. Really? You send it all the way from Oregon to the Ohio State University? No, I'm kidding. I'm sure there are several OSUs, just like there are several MSUs. I went to Montana State University myself. So yeah, I know, Cryo. I know. I'm making a joke. <laughs> You're dating a professor there. Oh, very nice. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, that's really cool that you uh, you donate those uh, to the university. I'm sure they appreciate that. That's really cool. Yeah. Anyway. <sighs> well, let's get to our topic for today. There was something, an important event that occurred. On this very day, in 1957. It helped change the, the course of science, science funding, science education, everything here in the United States and arguably around the world after that. Its re reverberations continue to this very day. Let's us talk about it. <laughs> CBS Television presents a special report on Sputnik 1, the Soviet mm. space satellite. Douglas Edwards reporting. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It's a vacuum cleaner. It's the farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik, the first man-made satellite as it passed... Clearly CGI, says so Potok. <laughs> One of the places where the progress of the satellite is being watched most closely... <laughs> Let me see if anybody else has got the same brain disease that I have. When this when this flashed onto the screen, the first thing that jumped to my mind was what, chat? One of the places where the black and white footage. You've got a building there. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, I immediately thought <gasps> Godzilla. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah, like, immediately. This is immediately what jumped to mind for me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway. Is being watched most closely is the Hayden Planetarium in New York. CBS News correspondent Richard C. Hotlet reports from there now. Where's Raymond Burt? Yeah. Doug, we're in the great reporting live from the Tokyo. Hayden planetarium Kennedy. in New York, and I have with me Dr. Kenneth Franklin, an astronomer on the planetarium staff. Hmm. Dr. Franklin, can you tell us where the Sputnik is now and how it's moving? 
Right now it's north of Auckland, New Zealand and moving southeast. It will be in 10 minutes about 1500 miles north of Little America. Wait, did you see what happened there? I think his his truck or something broke off. Watch. About 1500 miles huh. southeast. It will be in oh. 10 minutes. <laughs> Fell out. <laughs> and then Ever the professional, he picks it up and then just draws with the nub there. The marker tip broke up. I don't know what that was. Live mistakes. Yeah, diagonal, right? Little America. Just like here on Paleontologizing. Live mistakes. Uh, over Santiago, Chile. And at about 50 minutes from now, it will be over Spain. But hmm. it looks as though it'll be missing the United States on this trip. That's quite correct. It will. But it does come over here periodically, doesn't it? It comes over here at least twice a day and maybe more. Uh, getting back to this track, is it possible that it is transmitting a code, not just a beep signal for uh, radio uh, listening? Yes, it's quite possible that it's transmitting a code, uh, but we don't uh, realize what the code Grease is. Grease lead, is that the right, Claire Burns? The thrust to get it into the air comes from the lowest and biggest of the rockets in the tandem. When the American satellite is launched, the takeoff power will come from a rocket like this one shown in a recent test. The powerful thrust of the arrow bee sends the whole assembly up through the dense stratosphere, a layer of heavy air, 50 miles thick, surrounding the Earth. The first rocket is then dropped. There you go, Dinosaur Dave. Yeah. <laughs> the second rocket ignites and takes over. Use them in restaurants. Oh, nice, Clever. Yeah, like a grease pencil. Miles, satellite uh. being stripped for action. It's that round ball in the nose. Altitude better than 250 miles, and the second rocket burns out, but its momentum carries the whole assembly forward. Second rocket spent, the third and last one takes over, the final thrust that carries the satellite into its chosen orbit. Hmm. Then all the rocket power gone, but tremendous force has been built up, and the satellite is pushed off on its own at a speed of 18,000 miles an hour. So this was a huge deal when it happened. We're not really getting a sense of, like, the panic here in this broadcast, but, uh, there was panic in the United States. ...circling the Earth beyond the reach of the Earth's gravitational pull. Hundreds of miles in space, the satellite's instruments start collecting data, sending it back in the form of radio signals. A pilotless spaceship mans advanced scout in outer space. What precisely, what kind of information do you want from this satellite? What is it set up to do? There are hundreds of problems that we'd like to solve with these satellites. Practically every scientist across the United States would like to have his pet problem pursued. <laughs> no doubt early satellites will investigate temperature of outer space. They will use thermistors in order to do this. Mm -hmm. These thermistors are very delicate uh, devices which will register very Thermometers, changes basically. changes in temperature. Then also we will have weathermen uh, will put uh, photoelectric cells in the And there you go, dinosaur tape, yeah. And these will give us some idea of clouds. By y'all, I guess you mean Americans, right? That's in a very short often true, of time. collectively. And then uh, we shall also have the atomic scientists investigating the nature of cosmic particles. Well, so this is really interesting. It, it was pretty rare to have scientists on TV at this time. But this was kind of a shift that started because... Of Sputnik. Sure, what about the vital question that everybody is thinking about? Why and how did the Russians beat us to the draw? Oh boy. <laughs> this really was. The powers that be here in the United States were deeply embarrassed by this. That, you know, this backwards country, the Soviet Union, that they could. They could humiliate the United States by this incredible scientific and engineering achievement. You know, we were years and years and years behind on this. They beat us to the punch. It's kind of crazy. Like, this is why the U.S. was so surprised by this. Just like a couple decades earlier, you know, under, under the czar, Russia was like maybe the poorest country in Europe per capita, you know, extremely backwards, just, I, I, 
inconsequential. And then suddenly, they are leading the world in scientific achievement. That's incredible in just a few short decades. So yeah, yeah. Uh, 3D premises, they learned well from the Nazis and then the U.S. caught up. I mean, the U.S. was doing the same thing. Um, both the U.S. and the Soviets and the British all had uh, captured Nazi scientists. Um, Soviet Union was still able to beat us to the punch, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Caravan studies this subject professionally pledges to remain po politely silent a caravan what no i want to if you study this professionally i want to i absolutely want to hear your opinion on this one 100 percent. tell me about it caravan yeah i'm sure you know a lot more about this than i do sure this is my broadcast but i want to hear from an expert here if this is what you study yeah uh anyway and Cryos says, side note, the International Space Station has a dedicated ham frequency to talk with ham enthusiasts. It is cool to be able to talk to space. <laughs> is it like, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, where was that? Um, just found this a while ago. Where is it now? I, like, I googled this like, less than a month ago. And now Google isn't bringing it up. Here we go. Scrolling, scrolling. Caravan says, okay, there were some captured German scientists in the USSR, but the role was less important than the ones recruited by the US. Interesting. Very interesting. And thank you, uh, Osma Shah. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Uh, so you're saying that the US leaned more heavily on you know, captured Nazi scientists, captured German scientists, than the USSR did? That, like, because in that case, that would make the Soviet achievement even more impressive there. Uh, very interesting, if that's the case. Correct me if I'm, if I'm misinterpreting here. Let me know. Here we go. Well, in answer to that, I'd like to say it's probably the atomic scientists investigating the nature of cosmic particles. Well, Dr. Newell, what about the vital question that everybody is thinking about? Why and how did the Russians beat us to the draw? Well, in answer to that, I'd like to say a few introductory words first. When we began our program, the planners and the engineers and the scientists drew up a schedule for themselves which consisted of a number of logical engineering steps to lead to the final objective. Now this schedule placed them in a race with time because they had to get the satellite up during IGY. 
And naturally, IGY was the, if I remember correctly, this was the International Geophysical Year, which is a time when the United States and the Soviet Union were kind of working in cooperation with one another, or at least, at least they were kind of, there was this like big joint project where they'd kind of be celebrating the, well, celebrating science, funding their research. You know, trying to, to answer cool problems and stuff like that. The International Geophysical Year. 1957 to 58. Thank you, Caravan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you love this tangent? Thanks, Tony is my baby. I'm glad I'm glad you're glad you're having a good time here. Yeah. Um So yeah. Yeah. That's the IGY. Because they had to get the satellite up during IGY. And naturally we can assume that the Soviets did the same thing. And they were in a race with time also with the same deadline. Mm -hmm. hmm. It uh, therefore seems quite reasonable that one or the other would get a satellite up first. Mm -hmm. It would, in fact, be a very remarkable coincidence if both of them went up on the same day at the same time. Was it a surprise to you that they got there first? Well, it was something of a surprise. And naturally, since this generates a certain amount of scientific rivalry, something of a disappointment to us, but this does not lessen our admiration of what the Soviets have done. Moscow has hmm. not been passing up its opportunities, as CBS News correspondent Dan Shore observes in a recorded report from Moscow. So though the main Soviet papers today devote more than half their space to the satellite, wow. the front page banner headlines such as rarely seen in this country, there are precious few scientific details being divulged. Mm. Headlines are about Glorious victory of Soviet science, or, as the <laughs> communist youth paper says in a banner, the first in the world is ours. That's the right. Exploiting the satellite as a political and propaganda triumph. A Pravda editorial says, no social system is so interested in developing science as the socialist system. <laughs> Our scientists have achieved outstanding results with the effective support of the Communist Party and Soviet government. Here again is a report by Howard Smith on some of these current vibrations in Washington. Well, there's very profound concern oh, cool, here about Neat. world Neat. opinion. The dominant conflict of our time, the Cold War, is at present, as everyone knows, in a state of balance between Russia and the West, and in between are those people who are called uncommitted, who may determine who wins, the peoples of Asia, the Near East, and Africa. Russia already enjoys one great attraction for these important peoples, and their ambition is to pull themselves up from primitive agrarian countries to become modern industrial nations. They tend to admire Russia as primitive a nation which is backward as they, but which did pull herself up. And now that backward Russia has beaten the West's most advanced nation into the fringes of outer space, their admiration for Russia can be expected to increase. And there may be another consequence. Russia the dinosaur gap, Dr. Irrevitable, yeah. nations who grant bases <laughs> to America. Those threats have not been taken very seriously, but now the world knows that it took a far more powerful projectile than America possesses to push that satellite into its orbit in space. In view of that, Russia's threats may be more effective from now on. Probably no one here in the nation's capital would disagree with one thing that Senator Wiley said. We had better get on our toes. Now back to Douglas Edwards. Here in New York, the latest word off the news wires indicates that there has still been no confirmed actual sighting of the Soviet space satellite. Astronomers hmm. around the world, however, of course, lining up their sights and expect to be tracking it soon. Meanwhile, according to the latest Russian reports, uh, Sputnik 1 holds its course some 560 miles out in space. Hmm. And uh, as we've heard in these reports from both at home and abroad Almost this over. afternoon, the course of United States policies in the competition with Russia has been severely shaken. This is Douglas Edwards. Good evening. Severely shaken. So this was a major shock when it occurred. When Sputnik first went up, It was a wake-up call for the United States. And that would have... This is really why we're talking about Sputnik today. This is why I'm excited to talk about this. That's why it's relevant to what I talk about here. It would have profound ramifications for the funding of science 
and for science education here in the U.S. And most of these were fairly positive at first. Until they weren't. We'll talk about why. But first, let's lay some groundwork. Let's talk about the, uh, the initial impact. The Borisov station that the IP-1 observation station close to the launch site was the first to hear the sound that changed the world. Beep, beep, beep. The world yeah, beep, 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 just like, uh, Caravan. Typed that out earlier. And how you doing, Doki Doki Baka? Welcome, welcome. Uh, Helgram, what's shaking? It's good to have you here. Yeah... Um, and Caravan says, fun fact, Sputnik immediately settled one issue of international law, the right to orbit satellites over another country's territory. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. I was just reading, a, there's a book by Neil deGrasse Tyson that uh, I just got to the chapter on this like last week. So listen, I've been listening to this audiobook for like a year, um, bit by little bit when I go out for walks and stuff. But yeah, yeah, this idea that... Uh, like, you know, airspace is a concept in international law. But what about space space? And this is just like, well, they settled it through action here. It's like, it's up there. Let's deal with it. Yeah. Um, and Lenina says, I remember going to a science museum when I was younger, and they had a Sputnik replica. It was so beautifully displayed that I can still see it clearly in my mind. Yeah. Uh, we've got one of these in the Bay Area. Um, at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Up in the Oakland Hills. It is, uh... Yeah, unfortunately there's a lot of light pollution, so it doesn't... It's not a particularly well-positioned observatory. But, uh, it is beautiful. It's a really, really nice facility. And they've got a Sputnik replica there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find a photo of it, though. There's, like, a uh, an Apollo capsule, I think. But I don't know if... Hmm. Let's put Sputnik in quotation marks so we can make sure... There it is, yeah! There's the replica there. So it's about the size of a beach ball. I think it's like 56 centimeters in diameter. So it's basically, the actual steel part of it is like this wide. And then it's got those four antennae on it. Um, so yeah, mechanically, very simple. Very, very simple. And this is at Chabot, exactly, Thalo, yeah. Yeah. Emelis is definitely smaller than I expected. That's the thing, is apparently... Maybe we'll scoot back to the beginning of this video and I'll show you, but, uh... They had planned a larger satellite at the beginning, and they just lacked the capacity to get it up there on time. One of the reasons that the... the Soviets were able to beat the Americans into launching a satellite into Earth orbit was that they were really realistic about what they could do, and they're like, well... We'd like to have one up there that can actually have measurement equipment and, you know, a more complex kind of uh, satellite. But I don't think they had the proper launch vehicle for that. And so they just decided to uh, start off with something a little bit more modest, more simple, smaller, more doable. And they got it done. Uh, anyway, here we go. Yeah, let's talk about the aftermath. As I mentioned at the start of this video, the news of Sputnik's successful launch made enormous waves around the world. The Soviets, who had kept their cards close to their chest during construction and launch, now gleefully presented it to the world as an example of Soviet technical brilliance. Although saying that, it did take them a few days to really get up to speed with the historic moment. The day after hmm. the launch, there was hardly any news on the event from within the Soviet Union, but this quickly changed hmm. as 
news began circling the globe. The radio transmission could be picked up by amateur radio users around the world, and suddenly millions were enthralled by the beeping coming from space and the distant spot that orbited the Earth once every 96 minutes. People gathered <laughs> outside, searching the skies until they found Sputnik race. I... I don't think they actually saw Sputnik, though. The object itself is really small. What they, I'm guessing that what they actually saw was like part of the launch vehicle. Um, cause that's the thing. It's the size of a beach ball and it's hundreds or thousands of miles away, you know? Even if it was extremely reflective, it would still be pretty tricky to actually spot. I bet you what they were actually spotting. Not the the ISS was way later. You know that, Bio. <laughs> Hundreds of miles away. Okay. But the size of a beach ball. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Through the stars. However, what most people didn't realize was that they were actually seeing the R7 rocket that was accompanying Sputnik in orbit. Sputnik. <laughs> what did I tell you? What did I tell you? Yes. <laughs> ah. There you go. Yeah. Um So I guess they were they were on a similar trajectory uh after Sputnik detached from the launch vehicle. But yeah, yeah. It was almost certainly too small to be seen by the human eye, and the R7 had a special coating added to it to help it reflect sunlight better. There you go. Most people wouldn't have cared anyway. The concept of any man-made object traveling above the Earth was simply groundbreaking enough. But one nation that was shaken. SB says Sputnik orbited 1.5 times higher than today's ISS. Really? Wow. And it's so much smaller. Yeah. Yeah. A country experiencing a 1950s heyday that had seen enormous opportunities and possibilities open up for those across the socioeconomic spectrum. The nation was booming, and there was a sense of invincibility and, dare we say, arrogance. The idea that a country as strong and impressive as the United States could be beaten by the still backward Soviet Union was barely given a second thought before Sputnik's launch. But that all changed when American radio sets began to pick up Sputnik's beeping. The feeling of defeat was compounded by the lack of knowledge regarding the first satellite into space. The American government only had a vague idea of what was passing above them, and it didn't take long for rumors to emerge that it might be carrying weapons. Shortly after hmm. the University of Illinois Astronomy Department began using an interferometer to measure signals from the satellite to gain a better idea of its size. When this information came back, and with its subsequent publication in the journal Nature, the reality became a little clearer. Nature. Hmm. This was not a huge satellite camera. That's interesting. Like, I associate nature more with biology, but I guess in that sense, like, in this particular case, they made an exception, maybe? Or maybe nature used to be broader in its purview? I don't know. But yeah. In the journal Nature, the reality became a little huh. clearer. This was not a huge satellite carrying weapons, but a metallic beach ball that beeps. But Pandora's box had already been opened, and a series of frankly hysterical articles and news reports, some from the uber-trusted New York Times, created mm. a hysteria. Oh, gee, when has the New York Times ever created hysteria through bad reporting and just plain bad journalism? You know, they would never lie about things like weapons of mass destruction, right? To get the U.S. into a needless war and kill, like, a million people? Mm, they'd never do anything like that. Yeah, crazy talk, right, says Sadman? Yeah. Ah! Beeps. But Pandora's box had already been opened, and a series of frankly hysterical articles and news reports, some from the uber-trusted New York Times, created near hysteria mm. as they greatly exaggerated not only Sputnik's capabilities, but what might come next. The mainstream media, no doubt eager to capitalize on the story of the decade, sowed an air of panic that would take some time to fully dissipate. It was a period in the USA that came to be known as the Sputnik Crisis. Things hmm. got even worse for the U.S. You wondered Soviet when you sense correctly. Sputnik too, containing yeah. a dog named... Caravan says the Soviets were impressed by the reaction to Sputnik in the Western media. Khrushchev knew he had something important. Oh, yeah. I bet. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And Kenny says the orbit wasn't circular and the Earth wasn't centered in the orbit. So the perigee and apogee were very different. Interesting. So it's... 
it's going to be an elliptical thing. It's going to get close to the Earth and then far from the Earth and then close and then far. Interesting. Things got hmm. even worse for the US when the Soviet Union successfully launched Sputnik 2, containing a dog named Laika, which became yeah. the first living being in space on the 3rd of November 1957. This was then followed oh, like on the 6th of December 1957 by the disastrous televised launch of the Vanguard TV-3, which managed to gain an altitude of 1.2 meters before falling back onto its launch pad and exploding. The score... Oof. Seems like a SpaceX kind of project. Um, what exactly did Sputnik do? It went into Earth orbit and made beeping noises, Pimpcat. And subsequently caused mass panic in, uh, in the United States. Yeah. Soviet Union 2, USA 0. And that this is really cool. What? Is this like some Soviet artwork or something? <laughs> Oh, that's really neat. I like this. I like this. Man. Yeah. Pipcat says, did it broadcast TV? No, it 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 broadcast uh over the radio a beeping noise. Um Yeah. And Leica is so cute. Shoot. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson has a bit about this. Um about Leica the dog maybe I can find that real quick yeah um maybe I can't find it shoot um, but he's got a little bit about this where, like, don't you feel bad for that dog that was up there in that space capsule who, who ended up dying? You know, little, little Laika. Um, and he says, well, yes. I don't know if he said yes. Anyway, I would feel bad for this individual dog, but her story is kind of different once you realize that Laika was a like a feral dog on the streets of Moscow before this and that's not an easy life and she became world famous after this she was on postage stamps we still remember the name of this dog to this very day she was a an international hero. So yeah, yeah. So rather than just like freezing to death in a Moscow winter, we still remember this dog to this very day. That's I don't know, that's that's pretty cool. She was a stray dog, yeah, Kennedy, yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, the street dogs commute in and out of the suburbs of Moscow because they can't afford to live in Moscow on the left. Anyway, yeah. Uh, and Tony is my baby. says, all the scientists that were closely involved took like a home to their families and did get attached to her. Really? Wow. Green Minstrel says, remembrance is a beautiful thought. I agree. I mean, shoot, let's let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Um. Let's take a look at this. On the morning of November 3rd, 1957, this quiet, unassuming street dog changed history. Oh. His mission was to prove that a living creature could survive in space. When Laika was sent to space, most people thought that going outside the atmosphere was impossible and that it caused death immediately. So it was necessary hmm. to collect data that simply proved that that isn't the case. Limoncek or Laika and others of the same breed learn like this and they seem to like it 
Laika's flight made headlines around the world and she quickly became a household name. For the Soviets, Laika's flight represented more than a scientific breakthrough. It was a source of national pride and proof that they were leading the space race against rival the United States. Hmm. It is very difficult to describe our feelings, but Laika's flight was something fantastic and unbelievable. That's that's a statue with Laika behind him, by the way. This dog is still remembered and revered in the present day. That is thought. The Russians have achieved something. They did such a good job. So we too did a good job then. Good job. <laughs> good job. Laika's symbolic mission was only ever intended as a one-way trip. Oh. But her cultural legacy can still be felt in Russia stairs. and abroad. Unfortunately, Laika died a few hours into the flight. The cause of death was put as overheating. Oh. Laika hasn't been forgotten, and in some sense she was always remembered, because many products at the time were named after her. There was even a haircut named Laika, so she really <laughs> affected the Soviet culture. Oh. Four years after Laika's journey, astronaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to travel into outer space. It was a pioneering mission that wouldn't have been possible without Laika's contribution to scientific knowledge. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera. Pretty cool stuff. I, uh, I briefly went out with a gal in Bozeman back when I lived in Montana, and she had a dog named Laika. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So back to, uh, to Sputnik here. This was then followed on the 6th of December 1957 by the disastrous televised launch of the Vanguard TV3, which managed to gain an altitude of 1.2 It's an American... ...falling back onto its launch pad and exploding. Yeah. The score, Soviet Union 2, USA 0. But, as we know, the launch of Sputnik spurred the United States on to do great things, eventually. In February 1958, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, later the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, was formed, and NASA formally came into being in October of that same year, although its mm. precursor, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, had been around since 1915. The Americans did manage to get a satellite into space on the 1st of February 1958 with its Explorer 1, and mm. remarkably, just over 10 years later, Neil Armstrong took his one small step on the surface of the moon. If the US had found themselves behind in the early stages, Ages, they burst out on the home stretch. As for Sputnik, the intrepid little satellite continued transmitting for 22 days, but continued to circle the Earth for two more months as its orbit hmm. began to decay, meaning it was dragged closer and closer to the Earth. On the 4th of January 1958, the end came for this historic metal beach ball as it finally burnt up while reaching our fiery atmosphere. There was a lot said about Sputnik after its launch, but most tended to completely skip over the fact the satellite was remarkably simple. Many got carried away with the nonsense there you go, of ghostly cool. <laughs> weapons or about the fear of the future. But Sputnik was small and relatively rudimentary. The Soviets had won the race into space because of simplicity. Had they waited for Objective D to be launched the following year with its complex instruments, it may well have been the Americans that won the race. The Soviets had stripped everything down to the bare minimum to win this race, and this tiny, lightweight explorer proved to be exactly what was needed. The name Sputnik is one that mankind will never forget. Pretty cool. So Pretty cool. Here's a link to this video there. Take a look at this. Sir, what do you think about this achievement of the Russians? I think it's a remarkable thing. My only regret is that we couldn't get there first. What do you think this is going to be due to our prestige? I don't think it's going to enhance it any at this time, but I imagine we will be able to catch up and maybe even surpass pass them on the way. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's frightening. Uh, we should find out what they're doing that we're not doing. And we should do something about it very quickly. 
What do you think? Well, I think uh, Russia's accomplishments are greater than ours, and I'm not too disturbed about it, but I feel that the United States will succeed eventually in putting a man into space. And hmm. you? Well, I think that, it, you know, Russia's getting into space really bothers me, because it's making the Cold War between the Russia and the United States, you know, more intense. You know, there's going to be more tension between in world peace. I doubt whether this was actually accomplished. Uh, he's the man seemed to be hidden for two, three days. Oh, uh, we got we have a truther way back even then in 1957. He's like, eh, yeah, I don't think this is real. <laughs> I think they're lying about it. They could say anybody did the situation. If if they actually accomplished it, they would have. Uh, they would have uh, announced it immediately. They did. They, they did announce it immediately. Uh... What is your feeling about this Soviet accomplishment? Well, as usual, they, they're ahead of us. <laughs> A little step ahead. But that doesn't mean much, actually. It means that they took the risk that we didn't dare take, probably, because it's too dangerous for a man. You're not particularly worried about their getting there first. You know, the world has always been on the edge of catastrophe since it exists. <laughs> I don't think it's much worse now than there's ever been. If you read the history, you see every generation has a terror of being destroyed completely or something like that. I mean, are they exactly the same with a little more, I say? I don't know. He's kind of wrong about this. There are certainly times that are more placid than others, you know? A little more uh, actual danger because the, the scale is much larger. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Interesting stuff. And we've got a little bit more right here talking about this. This is not from 1957. What? What is this from? The Wonder Years. Yeah, sorry. I'm not that interested in that. Sputnik was the first man-made thing that ever floated above our heads in outer space. It didn't do anything but send out innocent radio beeps. But Sputnik was earth-shattering. Not only because it was the cool first man-made thing in space, but because of the rocket that got it there hmm. and what that rocket meant. Yeah. So this kind of rocket could be an ICBM. Sputnik up could also carry nuclear weapons in space. They were using Sputnik to, to try to scare the United States, to scare Americans into the idea that we were all in danger of some Soviet nuclear weapon coming from space. The United States is in a state of confusion and surprise. Sputnik was the 9-11 of our day. People were shocked that Russia had a technology that could do this, and we didn't. America said, now wait a minute. Russians can't even build a refrigerator. What are they doing putting a Sputnik, a satellite, into orbit? We were convinced as Americans that we were the dominant power in the world. We had to be. So the idea that our- Bill for Fluffernut says, what was the point of the radio beeps? To demonstrate that it was up there. You couldn't actually spot the satellite itself because it was too small. So having those radio beeps being broadcast from it, you know, you would be able to pick that up from Earth, you know? Does that make sense? So it's too small to see. It's got to broadcast something that you can pick up. Our arch enemy, the... And there you go, Mayor Space. I agree, Soviet yeah. Empire could beat us by getting into space first was just devastating. I mean, people were walking around saying, how can this happen? You know, U.S. is number one. What, what, what is this? This is the Soviet Union's first man-made Earth satellite on display at the USSR Industrial Exhibition in Moscow. Ever since the news of Sputnik flashed around the world, America has been asking questions. What went wrong? How did a nation of backward peasants forge so dramatically ahead of us in the race to space? And Sculpin says, not true. You could see it. I mean, we talked about that earlier. Uh, you could see something, but it wasn't the actual satellite itself. It was the 
uh, the rocket that got it there, you could see the launch vehicle because it was much larger, and it was traveling uh, along the same trajectory. Uh, the R7 rocket. There you go. Thank you, Subamf. Yeah, yeah. So people could see the R7 rocket, and, you know, they're like, oh, there's Sputnik. Well, fair enough. It's the rocket that got it up there. Same difference. But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the beeping was to help demonstrate, too, even during daylight, you know, you could still detect it, which is cool. Yeah. It gets the American people alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this. And it's, we fear this. We fear that they have something out that majority of the people don't know about. Senator Jackson of Washington describes the Russian achievement as a devastating blow to the prestige of the United States. The people of the United States have been humiliated. They're disturbed and they're unhappy. The enemy of ours has outdistanced us. Russia's getting into space really bothers me. We are headed downhill to the status of a second-rate world power. <laughs> night after night, politicians and other leaders were telling Americans that Sputnik revealed that we were at great risk. An interesting SP, that makes sense. Huh. But our security is at stake. We surely don't want to become hysterical, but let's become factual. Let's start telling the truth. And let's face the fact that we've taken a licking, psychologically at least, and scientifically. And it has embarrassed us throughout the world. Hmm. If Russia wins dominance of this completely new area, well, I think the consequences are fairly plain. Probable Soviet world domination. <laughs> so important stuff again that satellite was launched on this very day october 4th 1957 66 years ago today and i'm not an astronomer i'm not a rocket surgeon i don't know very much about this the reason that we're talking about this is that it had broad implications for science policy around the world especially here in the united states for science funding, for science education, for the public's relationship to science and scientists. That is what I want to talk about here. That's what I want to emphasize, and we're going to get into that. There are people here in the chat who know much more about Sputnik 1 itself than I do. I'm not an expert in this. But as a science communicator, somebody who does this full-time, I do a lot of thinking about what is the public's relationship to science and how did it get to where it is today understanding that is really important so to help us understand that there's a great book that I have over here that I've read a number of times that deals with science and the public and politics it's called the war on science by Sean Lawrence Otto we'll watch a clip in a little bit from the author talking about this but uh good book i'd recommend it you can also get it as an audiobook but it's been on sputnik is one that i've always remembered here and let's talk about it page 112 to 113 there we go oh I've done something that I rarely do. I actually uh, dog-eared the page here. <laughs> Didn't realize I had done that. But yeah. So, uh, subtitle is "The Protection Racket" from the chapter "Gimme Shelter." Uh, the fear that was changing the nation kicked up another notch when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the first Earth-orbiting satellite, on October 4th, today, 1957. Its diminutive size, about that of a beach ball, made it perhaps the most influential 23-inch diameter object in history. 
Traveling at roughly 18,000 miles an hour, the shiny little orb circled the planet about once every hour and a half, emitting radio signals that were picked up and followed by amateur radio buffs the world over, but nowhere more closely than in the United States. Sputnik shocked America in ways that even the 1949 Soviet nuclear test had not. For the first time, the commies were not just catching up, they were ahead. The fear that North America stood at risk of being overrun by an authoritarian society, the little orb fo focused an amorphous fear and placed the entire continent in danger, at least psychologically. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaur. Well, thank you, Andy Iron Man, for those hundred bits. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> um, thank you, Andy Iron Man. And have you no respect for books? I rarely dog your page, uh, Lordy, but I did here because I wanted to be able to access this quickly, I guess. Uh... Yeah, in the United States, since the 1949 Soviet nuclear test, debates have been swirling about the need to invest more in education, particularly science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, often referred to as STEM, S-T-E-M, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, because of their critical importance to national defense. But until Sputnik, these discussions had foundered on the shoals of congressional indifference. The U.S. government wasn't interested in funding science. Now, those debates came into sharp focus. As historian and bids can make a wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation of understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. Thank you, thank you for those thousand bits. We fear that they that have is, uh, the don't know is extraordinary. Sorry. Uh, the soundboard triggered our video to play again. Um, thank you, thank you, Barile. I really appreciate that. Enjoy that 5K bits batch. Good stuff. Uh, uh, so now these debates about science funding came into sharp focus. As historian Joanne Brown put it, the struggle for federal aid may have been won in the sky, but it was fought in the basements, classrooms, and auditoriums as educators adapted schools to the national security threat of atomic warfare and claimed a proportionate federal reward for their trouble. Within a year, the National Defense Education Act of 1958 was passed with the goals of improving education in defense-related subjects at all grade levels and bolstering Americans' ability to pursue higher education. The NSF's budget, the National Science Foundation, which had been quite low prior to this, jumped dramatically in 1957 and continued to grow. Science would become a major issue on the presidential campaign trail in 1960. If Americans didn't recommit to science and technology, it was argued they might lose the Cold War. Their entire way of life, perhaps their very survival, was at stake, and it all hinged on what, what they could do to protect themselves by reinvesting in science and technology to beat those darn Ruskies. Quotation marks in the original. American public opinion about science, which for 12 years since the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been one of great moral ambivalence, began a new relationship with it almost overnight. Scientists might be SOBs, family-friendly channel, but they were American SOBs. So I would really recommend this book if you want to kind of dive into the relationship between the American public and science and scientists. It's good stuff. Uh, the War on Science by Sean Otto. Uh, so yeah, yeah. And duck and cover. There you go, Sculpin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Sputnik suddenly made science education and science funding a priority in the United States. Which sounds like a good thing. And it... It was a good thing. Mostly. At the time. Suddenly there was more money from federal and state governments and from uh, from private funding sources as well for science and scientists, including paleontology. There was a bit of a resurgence in dinosaur paleontology, little bit, little bit, in the 1950s. Much bigger resurgence in other fields of science, like atomic science, physics, etc., but, uh, science for war, yeah, ghostly ghoul, uh. But at the same time, 
Well, there were some unforeseen consequences about this. From this. And uh, to discuss that... Well, shoot. Um, we have to look at the... Let's talk for a minute about where science funding comes from. When you watch D News or other... Rip. There we go. I know we've had our differences in the past, me and this channel. They've gotten some... They've had some kind of lousy dinosaur videos, but... Let's take a look at this here and hope that it's pretty good. I've not watched this yet. When you watch D News or other awesome science shows, people say this paper, a new study, researchers, or a team from, but how much money do we have to spend to get that science? Sup, nerds? Trace here for D News. Science hey. and money have. Don't talk to my audience that way. Watch your mouth always had a contentious relationship. Alexander Graham Bell borrowed money from the parents of a wealthy student to help create the Harmonic Telegraph. Science needs capital, which can often mean a trip to the capital. But come on, who really pays for science? First, how yeah, much are we I'll be right back. It depends on your lab, the university, your company, the type of science. Getting telescope time is not the same as finding and tracking thousands of participants for a 10-year-long study. But here's one example. Let's say you're hired in an average university's biology department. You're going to have to be doing research there, so you negotiate what is called a startup fund, which could be, say, $400,000. Wow, that's a ton of moolah, but it's actually not. We've just started. From there, researchers need equipment, staff, consumable products like pipettes, petri dishes, beakers, plus bits and bobs for every stage of the experiment. To get money for all of As you can probably guess, I'm going to be talking about how much cheaper it is to do work on dinosaurs than it is to do chemistry work in a laboratory or a lot of biological research or physics or astronomy or whatever else. Um, yeah, shoot. Our our entire budget for this past uh, field season in, uh, in Dolings Bowl in Utah was I think it was about $600. Yeah. Uh, you know how far $1,000 goes in the field? Absolutely, Claire Burr. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, it goes a long way, Golganek. It goes a long way. But part of that is that we have the same equipment that they had back in 2006. We were talking about this uh, just the other day when we were talking about herbivorous dinosaurs, Falcarius. We saw that documentary from 2006. Um, where, like, that was the same generator in 2006 that we used this summer when I was in the field. Those are the same paintbrushes. Those are the same, like, conduit, bits of conduit that hold up the shade tarps, etc., etc., you know? MLF says, that's so ridiculous, I can get, barely get lunch for that, for $600. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And is archaeology more expensive to do research? From what I've heard, it's... Much more expensive. Oops, kaputs. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, dinosaur paleontology, we're used to working on a shoestring budget. That's just how it goes, you know? Yeah. All of that stuff, scientists have to apply for grants. I asked Dr. Johansson of PBS's It's Okay to Be Smart, a biologist, and he said, for biomedical science, the gold standard of research grants is the National Institutes of Health R01 grant, which could be like four or $500,000. Looking into it, there were yeah, we, uh, applicants and only 294. In paleontology, we're usually not eligible for NIH grants. The gold standard in paleontology would be an NSF grant, the National Science Foundation. And um, if you get a, uh, an NSF grant, it's like that can make your whole career, you know? It's a huge deal. Um, it makes you much, much, much more enticing as a... Uh, a hiring prospect like somebody might might readily hire you for a job after if you have a history of getting an NSF grant you know yeah were awarded in 2015 that's about a 14% award rate 
So between startup funds and a big grant, you might have eight or 900K. That sounds like a lot, but even that can't cover everything. Plus, the university takes a cut of whatever scientists win, sometimes as much as 50%. Apparently, some of the Ivy League universities, like I think it's Harvard. Harvard takes like 80 or 90% of your grant funding. Harvard University, which has an in, like, an, a truly insane uh, financial endowment. It's something like $4 billion or something like that. Um, here, let's, let's look it up. Um, okay, way, way more than I thought. $50.9 billion. That's more than a lot of countries. And yet they'll still take 90% of your uh, of your grant funding if you're unlucky enough to be at Harvard, you know? Um, yeah. Well, that money's tied up. Yeah, <laughs> Dark Mock Rises. <laughs> um, yeah. You know what that reminds me of? Give me a second here. Junk drawer folder. There we go. I think that was season five? Or maybe it was six? There's Rosebud. I'll never leave you behind again. <clears throat> ah, yes. Uh, naturally, I can't pay you much of a reward because I'm strapped for cash. Oh. <clears throat> As you can see, this old place is falling apart. But I'm sure we can come to an understanding. Yes, sir. Reject the first offer. Reject the first offer. May I offer you a drink? Sorry, Burns. No deal. <clears throat> And hang on a minute, before all of that golden treasure fell through the ceiling. Did I spy with my little eye? Oh, come on. Gotta be quick with the pause. Okay, not a Triceratops. I thought maybe it was a Triceratops. But he's got a, a taxidermied unicorn on the wall. <laughs> uh, uh. As you can see, this old place is falling apart. Anyway, this, that's Harvard, basically. Um, yeah. <laughs> 50.9 billion. I mean, that is, that's incredible. It really is. It really is. And still, they'll take 90% of your grant or something like that if you're a scientist there. Insane. Insane. I can't talk too much about that or I'll get myself in trouble, but it's nuts. This is why scientists scam. spend so much of their time applying for grants. Yep. Science is really expensive and time-consuming. It is time-consuming. 
it's not super well it doesn't have to be that expensive i don't know the the universities make it expensive by taking most of your grant money you know this is one of the reasons why i'm so happy to be here and to be out of that rat race you know and funding has to be in place before a single bit of research can be started as scientific american wrote scientists spend too much time raising cash yep. instead of doing experiments this is true. Uh, if you're a scientist and you're writing grant applications, that might occupy like 80% of your work time. Like you go to work and you're basically mostly writing grant applications and going to meetings and you're spending much less time actually doing science, you know? No longer fighting with Jolene. There you go, Gimp. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not fighting Jolene any longer. So where does this money come from? Most science is funded by governments. In the U.S., it can come from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, Defense Department, Department of Education, or even the Fish and Wildlife Service. I mean, yep. that's what the government does, right? It collects taxes and distributes that money for the good of us all. But since the 2008 Great Recession and 2010 sequestration, remember that little ditty? Science's funding has dipped significantly. This can mean fewer studies, yep. fewer discoveries, and fewer breakthroughs. In fact, there are... I've read some abstracts from from published papers that say that like the the pace of of scientific discovery in the United States has tapered off significantly over the past couple of decades. It's uh yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. And oops kaput says Sabine Hosenfelder is funding her research with YouTube. Very cool. Well shoot, I have been funding my own research and field work with Twitch. Oops, Caputs, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, this past summer, well, we were doing a bunch of field work in Wyoming. There we go. Um, being an archaeologist in Wyoming. And, uh, I was talking about archaeology there for a second, for some reason. That's a process that can take a year in and of itself. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a long lead time between when you first dig up a dinosaur and then when it actually gets published. In, in. Here's some of the actual work taking place here. You do a side strip, which would be a second plastering session. And then you flip it over, and then you have to do the bottom. So it can be as many as three. I didn't actually do very much digging in that broadcast there. But, uh... I definitely did some in... Uh, this one here. Now they're going south and north. So that very... Anyway, this field work in Wyoming, digging up at least two new species of dinosaurs in Wyoming... This was funded primarily from this audience here on Twitch. It was uh, it was pretty extraordinary. The generosity from this community was amazing. So we crowdfunded this endeavor. It was uh, it was pretty extraordinary. And proud supporter, I. I'm proud of you and grateful to you, Tommy Platicus. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. And Sculpin, thank you for those five gift subs. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Extraordinary. I appreciate that. More fun than ding. I appreciate you, Sculpin. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um... Good stuff. Good stuff. So anyway, I'm really lucky that I don't have to spend 90% of my waking hours writing grant proposals. Instead, I spend maybe 20%, 15% of my waking hours streaming here on Twitch. And I can get two birds stoned at once because, you know, I'm doing outreach at the same time. 
I'm doing what I think ideally all scientists should do. You know, talk about their work with the general public. We'll be getting more into that in a bit. Uh, Sean Otto, author of this book, we've got a clip of him discussing this book and talking about how Sputnik kind of it stopped scientists from talking to the public, in a sense. Which has had really bad consequences nowadays. We'll get into that. First, let's continue this uh, discussion of science funding here. And, uh... Yeah. Yeah. But Danny, birds are dinosaurs killing two dinosaurs. With... No, we're not killing any birds or any non-avian dinosaurs here, Smorphosaurus. I said we were getting two birds stoned at once. A little bit different. Yeah. Um, yeah, and chat only takes 75% cut of the funds raised. <laughs> Beats, very funny. <laughs> Government monies are uh, through grants, offices, contracts, and programs. But though most of the money comes from the government, they're not alone at the table when the bill for scientific research gets developed and dropped. Lately, private companies have been paying for more science, which can be controversial. The, these captions are way out of sync here. Um, all, but since the 2008 Great Recession and 2010, yeah. remember that little ditty? Science's funding has dipped significantly. This can mean fewer studies, fewer discoveries. There you go, Sculpin. Purple Government haze. Monies are dispersed. Is there a purple haze right now? Shoot, let's let's look. Um, let's look outside at a webcam. It's actually pretty clear today. This is not too far from. Uh, from where I'm broadcasting right now in the East Bay Area. There's San Francisco off there in the distance. You can even see Sutro Tower. And if you look real close, you can... I think that's... Oh, maybe you can't actually see the Golden Gate Bridge. It's behind these... these cargo cranes in the Port of Oakland. Right? Anyway, it's a very clear day today. It was kind of smoky last week. And earlier this week, too. Kind of hazy. Nice and clear today. Yeah. Yeah, that's the Bay Bridge there. Sculpin, yes. Sometimes, from a different angle, we could see the Golden Gate Bridge in the distance. But it's blocked by these uh, these cranes from this angle. There's Sutro Tower. There's the Salesforce building. There is the Transamerica Pyramid. Which I don't think is... That owned by Transamerica anymore, but I still call it the Transamerica Pyramid. Who cares? Tomato Potato. And this is Alameda, California right here. Little island. Big naval base over there. And... Scoot this so you can see. I think... Is that the USS Hornet right there? World War II aircraft carrier? Uh, They've got a cool museum there. Anyway, and uh, cranes are also a type of bird. I mean, yeah, or a type of origami, Kennedy. Skyhawk281, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologize. I say, hi, mate. I followed you when you were off stream. How's you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Skyhawk. It's good to have you here. Today, on the 66th anniversary of the launch of the... Sputnik satellite, we're talking about science funding here in the United States and how the legacy of Sputnik still reverberates today. So yeah. Let's uh, let's get back to this little video on science funding. Through grants, offices, contracts, and programs, but though most of the money comes from the government they're not alone at the table when the bill for scientific research gets developed and dropped. Lately, private companies have been paying for more science, which can be controversial. These More closed captions are going nuts, so we'll get rid of them. clinical trials in medicine are funded by private companies. The controversy comes when the gal footing the bill has a vet. 
And hang on a minute. Let me make sure that my closed captions are on. They're not. Shoot. I'm sorry. I forgot about that. Closed captions. Testing. Testing. Tyrannosaurus. Camptosaurus. Diplodocus. No, Diplodocus, the sauropod dinosaur. Well, these closed captions aren't working very well either, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Vested interest in certain results. Think drug or tobacco companies. But not all private money is bad. Some private studies are partnerships with government grants, public universities, nonprofits, or foundations. And in an ideal world, it wouldn't matter who paid for it. It would all just be. I mean, we also have Twitch chatters who have funded some important science here, too. Thank you again, everybody. You know who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, everybody who subscribed to this channel, they're helping keep one young scientist off the streets, and I appreciate that tremendously, so thank you. Anyway. Science. Ideal world. Since the 1970s, when it peaked at 2% of GDP, the U.S. has spent less and less on research and development. According to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, we're now spending about 0.78% of our GDP on research. Ah, uh, and that's terrible because every money that you put into science funding, research spending, you get back like tenfold, you know? So instead, I guess most of that money is going toward, uh, you know, more important things like uh, subsidizing oil companies or giving tax breaks to the ultra wealthy, people who do not need it at all whatsoever. Um... Oops, kaputs. Do you see this chat? You see this? Well, well, well. Oops, kaputs, thank you. They say keep up the great work. Thank you for that little donation. I appreciate that. Oops, kaputs. That's not little to me. I appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Good stuff. <sighs> Donations like that, any bit of funding that, that paleontologists get, for instance, gets circulated through the economy. Unlike tax breaks for the wealthy where, like, oh, you know, some mega millionaire or billionaire... You know, maybe they'll buy a yacht and they'll park it in the Cayman Islands. Or they'll, you know, hide their money away in a Swiss bank or something like that. Really spectacular. Spare no expense. So it gets taken out of the economy. Thank you, Golganak, for gifting Oops Kaputs. Appreciate you, Golganak. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Golganak. Say a, a paleontologist, you know gets $20 of funding. Well, what's she going to use it for? If she spends it on research or if she spends it on fieldwork, all of that is going to go back into the economy. I remember back when I was working with, um, with Denver Fowler. Uh, when we were doing fieldwork in Montana together. Uh, Denver used to talk about this all the time. Uh, did they take that? I guess maybe they took that photo off their website. Um, About uh, shoot. I used to just be able to pull up this uh Crimity. They've redesigned their website and it's kinda screwy now. Dinosaurs. Nope. Come on now. Um 
Scientology staff? There we go. This is the image I was trying to find. So there's me. There's Denver Fowler. There's Jack Wilson, for whom Displetosaurus Wilson I is named. Maybe we'll get to that later on in the stream. SB. Maybe we'll get to that, like we talked about. But uh, Denver used to talk about this all the time, where, like, every dime of funding that we get for doing field work in Montana goes directly into local economies. And some of these local economies desperately need that. Case in point, places like Jordan, Montana. So this is Jordan, Montana right here. The metropolis that is Jordan, Montana. This is the Jordan. Listen to the listen to the driver here, or the person taking the video. It's got like a, a thick Eastern European accent, but listen to what he says. Are we speaking Russian? Jordan, Montana. In the middle of nowhere. This is the town. This is the only town in the entire county. Garfield County, Montana is roughly the size of some East Coast states. Like, it's it's almost as big as, like, Connecticut. He's speaking Polish. Oh. Very cool, Helgram. Langu. Thank you. JustGiatania.com all right, neat. Anyway, what did what did he say in Polish before he says "middle of nowhere"? Anyway, this is the town. This is the county seat. This is the only town in the entire county. So, Garfield County, Montana. There we go. Uh, at the 2020 census, the population was 1,173. That seems like an overcount to me, but... The town of Jordan itself has, like, fewer than 300 people, I think. And it's the only town in the whole the whole county. There it is. It's one of the biggest counties in the state of Montana. Um, what is the area? 4,847 square miles. Um... Let's see. List of countries and dependencies by area. Let's find a country that's smaller than Jordan, Montana. Um, let's see. Samoa is smaller. North Cyprus. South Georgia. These are mostly islands. Trinidad and Tobago. French Polynesia. Oh, no, Miles Square. No, shoot. No, 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 no. We got to scroll up. There we go. Uh, the Falkland Islands are smaller than Garfield County. Uh, the country of Qatar is smaller than, than Garfield County, Montana. This is an economically depressed area. Uh, Jordan, Montana. Oops. There's not a whole lot going on there. The population has been going steadily down, it seems, since about 1920. It's, uh... Shoot, just in the time that I was working there, from 2011 until 2005, 
14. And four summers of field work there, it had already been declining, where several of the, like, major establishments closed down. So Fellman's right here. This is Fellman's convenience store and gas station. This is where I've run into other paleontologists many, many times. Would run into Bill Clemens there, or Greg Wilson, or uh, or Dave DeMar. We would run into paleontological crews from across the country. You know, just having a bite to eat at Fellman's right here. Oh, sorry, Fellman's is over there. There's Fellman's over here. There's Garfield Motel. There's Fellman's with the gas station. Yeah. Right? Is that Fellman's? It's been so long. Yeah, that's got to be it. Anyway, um, that closed. A number of other businesses closed. My point is this. Every dollar of funding that we got for field work, we would bring from Bozeman, Montana, from where the Museum of the Rockies is. We would bring it to this community, and we'd spend our money here. We would buy gas at Fellman's or at the uh, Senex there. We'd buy groceries at Ryan's Food Farm in Jordan, Montana. We'd buy whatever supplies we could get in Jordan. We would buy them there, even if they were a little bit more expensive than if we were to get them at Walmart in Billings or something like that. We made an effort to actually spend money in the town of Jordan. Scientific funding, in this sense, it's going directly toward propping up this local economy like that. I kind of get the sense that when, when some people talk about science funding, they think that that money just disappears into the ether. But no, that's getting recirculated in the economy, and in our case, it's going to helping these people make a living there in this, frankly, kind of depressed town. But not only that, we're also bringing back scores of dinosaur fossils. And those are being studied... They're being cleaned, prepared, reposited in the museum. They're going on display. They're making Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana a tourist destination. It's propping up the economy of the state of Montana at the same time. I bet for every dollar worth of funding that we got for fieldwork, it was probably 10, 20, 30, 40 fold the state of Montana got in return. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Oh, and Langu666 says... Oh! The driver said, We are traveling through this town in the middle of nowhere in Montana State, which is enormous. Montana is enormous. It really is. So, yeah. Yeah. My point is that... When you're funding science, you're not just funding science. You're also improving society. You're helping people make a living. Don't even consider for for a moment, like, all of the benefits that come from the scientific work. Just in stimulating the economy. When you spend money on science, that money goes through the local economy before the science is even published, before the results even come out. Even not considering the actual scientific benefits and the way that that helps improve society, you're already using that money, you know, to help people make a living in those communities. That's my point there. Most of that is from the government, but these days, some scientists are even looking to the internet and crowdfunding to pay for their experiments, and that's just a whole other monster. Think of all the stories and huh. science and stuff we've talked about here on DNews, and the number of times you've been blown away by a new healthcare technology, an advance in space travel, or a paleontological discovery. Those Really? Ah. <laughs> I love how we're one of the big three right there. That's so funny. I mean, take a, take a second and consider that. Let, let's listen to that one more time and think about this for a second. In ...science and stuff we've talked about here on DNews, and the number of times you've been blown away by a new healthcare technology... Healthcare technology, expensive stuff. Think about how many hundreds of billions of dollars 
go into research and development and, and funding healthcare science. An advance in space travel. Space travel. Think about how incredibly, incredibly expensive space travel is. Or paleontological discovery. Those <laughs> and then paleontology. We are... It's crazy how much we do with such minuscule funding. And yet still, paleontological discoveries. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. Bits can make a wonderful that... difference in promoting the appreciation and understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. Jayco5000, thank you for those 1,100 bits. Holy cow, Jayco. I... I'm deeply grateful for that. Thank you, thank you. That's excellent. Thank you very much. But yeah, th think about that. Like, that makes a difference for me. Those 1100 bits make a difference for me. With that much money, I could... I could maybe buy a new all for field work. I don't know. You, there's a lot of dinosaurs you can dig up with a single all. I've had an all for about 10 years. Glue is cheap. I don't know. Glue is cheap. Paleontology is pretty inexpensive. It's pretty cheap. It's pretty cheap. Um. Where did the... Let's see. Scott Sampson's book, Dinosaur Odyssey, I think might mention this. Hang on, let me see if I can find that passage. Uh. About, like, the space shuttle, I think? Um... Ah, it's not in the index. Um, I want to say it was toward the beginning of the book. Quick Google search. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to find it. But anyway, the idea is... And I don't know if anybody's ever actually run the numbers on this in a... In a rigorous way. But... I've heard it said many times that just one routine launch of the U.S. space shuttle, for instance, talking about space travel, one routine launch of the U.S. space shuttle costs more money than has ever been spent in the entire history of dinosaur paleontology. In 200 years of digging up dinosaurs. 200 years? 2023, 1923, 1823. Yeah, I guess. Coming up on 200 years. Um, around the world. Globally. The amount of money that's been spent on dinosaur paleontology uh, less than a single launch of, of the U.S. space shuttle. Um, it's remarkable what we can do with very little funding. To the point where, shoot, the discoveries that we make are mentioned in the same breath as healthcare developments and space travel. Science and stuff we've talked about here on D News, and the yeah. number of times you've been blown away by a new healthcare technology, an advance in space travel, or paleontological discovery. Those things were expensive, and they were hard fought. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't grow up with money. Shoot, uh, um. I think that a thousand dollars is expensive for you know for field work, but 
Holy cow, that wouldn't even... That wouldn't get you anywhere in some other fields of science. Just makes me love them more. The research to do this video was super fun. I got neck deep into the budgets and excitement of science around the world. I had to way into it. I like to say the more I know about something, the more I want to know about something. Take something we all love, movies. Did you know a preacher? And this feels like it's going to be a prelude to an ad. Um, so anyway, yeah, yeah. The point is, uh, yeah. Science funding. Here, let's take a look at, I have not seen this video, but let's take a look at this real quick and see what the, the deal is here. Science funding is broken and it is getting worse over time. While major prestigious universities appear to be insulated from some of these issues due to their enormous wealth, many universities around the globe are plagued with funding issues and science is suffering every- Caravan says, I heard that Edward Drinker Cope blew all his, all his billions in funding on whiskey. He didn't have billions. Now, Cope actually grew up wealthy, Cope, Paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope. Um, he came from a wealthy family. So he had like generational inherited wealth. And he blew a lot of that later on in life on bad investments. Like he bought shares in a silver mine in Nevada or something like that, which was a scam. And he ended up losing much of his wealth that way. Um, yeah. Uh, he also spent a lot of money on field work, but he was also kind of notoriously cheap. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, gold bars, diamonds, and paper towels, these things are very expensive. Seems two of those three were much more expensive than the third. Yeah, Claire Burr, if you're talking about advancements in, uh, in medical devices, space travel, and then paleontology. <laughs> it's like... Oh man, I don't even know what super expensive cars are, but like, name two really, really expensive cars, and then like, a 1992 Geo Metro. <laughs> um... Yeah. Uh, Maserati, ugh. Very unreliable cards, from what I understand, Kennedy, but yeah, yeah. It's kind of funny, like, oftentimes the more expensive a car is, the, le the less reliable it is. A, uh, Bugatti Veyron. There you go, Mayor of Space. Bugatti. It sounds like something out of a nursery rhyme. What a dumb name. Um, but yeah, yeah. Bugatti. That's even dumber. A boogatti. Bug a T. You know what? I don't even care, and I'm like adamant about that. I am aggressively uninterested in pronouncing that correctly. Because what a stupid thing to spend money on. You know? I don't know. Some people love getting scammed, though. So, yeah. Um, you were saying Boo Earns, Pimp Cat? <laughs> Appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah. And tools for transportation should be functional, not flashy. I agree. I mean, they could be functional and flashy, but when it's flashy at the expense of being functional... That's when you run into problems. Things can be beautiful, definitely. Not everything has to be extremely utilitarian to the point where it's just <laughs> ugly. Like, but I don't know. When the priorities are all out of whack, that's when it's like, like, man, your priorities are out of whack. You know? Yeah. 
Anyway. Yeah. Speaking of money and stuff, let's get into this. Science funding is broken, and it is getting worse over time. While major prestigious universities appear Oxford, to be insulated Cambridge, from some of these issues Harvard. due to their enormous wealth, many universities around the globe are plagued with funding issues, and science is suffering everywhere. Yep. We have systematically neglected governmental funding of science. We have systematically neglected it. I This irks me a little bit. This desk is too too tall for this. I I built a desk last weekend <laughs> for a project, and I'm just noticing that this is too tall. But it's the perfect height for, you know, for putting your head on the desk. Maybe that's what it's designed for, because as a scientist, that's, there's a lot of this that goes on if you're, like, in a traditional kind of academic milieu, scrambling for funding and stuff like that. Grant writing. It's a grant writing desk. There you go, Claire Burr. Yeah. <laughs> we have systematically neglected governmental funding of science. Yeah. Allowing for an increase in vested interests and corruption within science itself. True. The system yeah. is rotten. That has fundamentally changed the way scientists work, taking them away from doing science and instead burdening them with bureaucracy. Yep, it's mostly paperwork now for a lot of scientists. Because science yeah. is so fundamentally. SB Harkin says, Do you have any grants to do science outreach? I have never once even applied for a grant, let alone ever gotten one. SB Harkin, yeah. Yeah. Important. To how we live today. Science has given us phones, computers, advanced medical equipment, and many more things that we can't live without, as well as more than a few amazing scientific accomplishments. Science is also discovering and inventing new things all the time, some of which may completely change our lives. But the way we fund science is one, wasting money. Yep. Two, Wasting the time of science. So much time. Three is not a fair method of assessment, and it does not yep. reflect scientific outcomes. True. Four, it can end the career of great scientists. So yeah, shoot. Einstein himself. Uh, could not find funding for his work prior to his publication on the theory of relativity and prior to that, uh, the big solar eclipse that kind of demonstrated his idea to the world at large. Prior to that, he had to get it, like, he was applying for a job as a high school teacher because <laughs> uh, he could not find funding for his work. Yeah. Sending them towards more palatable careers. So, how bad is the funding process how have we gotten to this position and is and was assessment misspelled there hd oh boy yeah <laughs> that's probably more that whatever uh the program he used for this <laughs> didn't have spell check in it but yeah yeah anyway is the funding process how have we gotten to this position and is there a oh, 1919 was the solar eclipse. Is that right, SV Card? Okay. Maybe it was even after. That. No, it would have been before that. Better yeah. way. Let's discuss it. Now I'm guessing many of you haven't. And uh, Mayor of Space actually makes it. Oh, this is a tangent here. But Mayor of Space says trucks are or are supposed to be the ultimate utilitarian vehicle. You're talking about like a pickup truck, right? Yeah. Well, pick em up trucks are. Uh... Here in the U.S., they're mostly a status symbol, um, you know, or a way to, like, kind of assuage, uh, I don't know. In my experience, what I've seen, pickup trucks mostly seem to be, like, a, a badge of of uh, masculinity for people who are not comfortable, necessarily, with their own masculinity. They have to have some sort of outward display of it. It's protesting too much, basically, you know? Most people who have pickup trucks never actually use them as pickup trucks. Um, yeah. Crazy wasteful upgrades you can put on them. My dad has worked with a guy who has a motorized step bar that costs more than my car. 
Uh, so that when he approaches the truck, the thing folds out instead of just the regular step bar that doesn't do that, and you can step on it exactly the same. Exact, yeah, mayor space. I mean, the fact that you have to have something with a step bar to get up into it in the first place means that the vehicle is too tall for you and is thus unsafe. But yeah, anyway, don't get me started on this. I'm going to get off on a whole tangent here, and I don't, I don't necessarily want to do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Tony's my baby says I build trucks for a living. Really? There's a thought. Oh. You could hire a dinosaur to put a swimming pool in your backyard. All you'd have to do is show okay. up for five minutes. Whop! Instant swimming pool. Jump Jess, thank you for the 13 months of support. I appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you, Jump Jess, for keeping me here on the air. And Tony's my baby says I build trucks for a living, like like in a in a factory. Cool. Uh, hoping that educating the working class around me can outweigh my negative environmental impact. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate your, uh, your viewpoint there, but you can't blame yourself for this kind of thing, you know? No ethical consumption under capitalism and all that, you know? It's, uh... It's tough. Yeah. Anyway. And don't mention Jeeps. Yeah, there you go, MLF. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Let's... Let's get back to this. Brand. That's okay. You aren't missing out on anything fun. Every grant... Oh, hang on. Now I'm guessing many of you haven't written a grant. I've helped friends write grant proposals before. I've never written a grant myself. That's okay. You aren't missing out on anything fun. Every grant process is different, but they basically all involve writing an application that is most likely exceedingly long. Yep. Then waiting for months for it to be reviewed, most likely by someone that is overworked and mm -hmm. underappreciated. Yep. And then after waiting all of this time and putting in all of this effort, you have a relatively small chance of success. Usually very small chance, like 5%, maybe. If you are unsuccessful, it might mean the end of your career. So other than the sadness and the hyper-competitive nature of this process, what are some of the issues? Well, for starters, it wastes a lot of money. Oh, yeah. One study estimated that 38 days of work were spent on every application. Holy cow! 38 days of work on every individual application? Grants took an average of 38 working days. Imagine spending more than a month writing an application for a single grant, and then you've got like a 5% chance of getting it, if that. <laughs> Frankly, in some cases, they already have somebody picked out, and the whole thing is just a formality in the first, like, it's just a dog and pony show. Uh, for the grant application added up to roughly 550 years, which is an insane amount of time for these scientists to spend not doing research, but writing grants. That's nuts absolutely nuts also in the case of the grants in this study 80 percent of the applicants were unsuccessful so 440 years of completely wasted research time actually that sounds kind of like a high success rate 20 percent of grants were were awarded that seems impossibly high but it doesn't end there for the lucky successful applicants they need to strap themselves in for an additional administrative work that can come with having a grant. This can include things like timesheets for the entire project on how you exactly yep. spend your time and how this fulfills the original grant proposal. So that's the thing. Science doesn't always move in a straight line like that. You make discoveries that you don't expect because we're working at the very forefront of human knowledge. We're discovering new things about the way that the universe works. We don't know where it's going to go. Nobody's ever done this before. 
if you're doing science, it is by its very definition uncharted territory. So you can't predict what results you're going to have because that's not how science works, you know? This can actually lead to scientists not being able to allocate their time to projects that they might have no fruitful outcomes. Yep. All because of a grant proposal that they wrote five years ago doesn't allow for it. A 2018 faculty work survey in the US found that researchers spend on average 44% of their time not working on research. And that's that actually seems kind of low 40 only 44% not working on research. I know researchers who spend like almost every waking hour working on things like grant proposals. You know, as a lot of scientists are paid uh... for grants, all of this time spent performing administrative tasks and applying for more grants wastes the grant money itself. In one study in Canada, they found that the peer review and approval process was more expensive than just giving the average grant money to all of the applicants. <laughs> of course it is. I've heard other people propose just having a lottery where it's like, if you're going to be funding science. Now I can see that my uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. <laughs> Perfect timing there. Uh, J9 Smess. Jasmus? How do I pronounce your name? Thank you for the tier three support for two months there. Holy cow. That is extraordinary. And I uh, really, really appreciate it. Holy cow. Holy moly. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, is it any wonder that I'm able to to make a better living doing this than I ever did, you know, working in an official capacity as a scientist attached to a museum or a university? I mean, holy cow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Jan Janine's mess. We got there. Oh, Janine's mess. Oh, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Janine, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Sarumlin had a a point here. They say for field work, maybe. That's the way funding works. But for things like medical studies, they have to be entirely designed from the outset, and any variation affects the statistics. I think you're thinking about it in a more granular way than I'm thinking about it. Or if it's like a big five-year grant, you don't know which of those particular studies is going to pan out. And you don't know, say you're testing, I don't know, some sort of a new medical device or something like that and you've got multiple different variants, the thing that you end up with at the end is not going to match your initial expectations, most likely. You know? I think that's the point that he was getting at, you know? But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Let's continue. In this case, the review process was truly a mind-boggling waste of money. Yeah. But maybe all of this is worth it. Maybe the competition is leading to better scientists. It's not. And maybe the lengthy grant process makes sure that only the best research is funded. Well, unfortunately not. One study found that whether or not a grant was accepted was more related to who reviewed the grant rather than the grant itself. Uh. found little correlation between grant review assessment scores and the citation of the research publications. Meaning that the review process was not good at estimating the impact of research. Another study found that when including for random variations in the grant process itself, 59% of the 620 accepted grants in their study were sometimes not funded. 
Jeez. indicating the significant <clears throat> element of chance in getting a grant application accepted. Yep. All of this combined doesn't bode well for the grant system. Grants waste a lot of money by being overly complicated and they are also poor indicators of outcomes. Another issue is that in some countries, science funding is decreasing over time. Yep. This clearly depends Relative on to GDP, what country you're in. Some countries are increasing their funding, but many are not. In the US, science funding steadily decreased as a function of GDP since the 1960s. By the way, take a look at this right here. What do you think led to this spike right there? You see it starts to shoot up after 1956? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, Sputnik. That's it. Yeah, the space race. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what we're talking about today. So yeah, but it has been steadily decreasing since... 1965, it looks like, or thereabouts. I mean, it was a... a two, over 2% 2 of GDP was spent on business and federal research and development as share of GDP. Wow. Huh. Going from a high of around 2.1% of GDP down to a low of around 0.7%. At the same time, funding for overall research and development is increasing, meaning businesses are more than making up for the lack of federal funding. But is this something that we want? Do we want our scientists to be beholden to companies to perform vital research? Mm, I would I say no. Not. Even in the case where funding isn't decreasing, the rate of successful applicants is meaning that we are overtraining for the number of jobs or we are potentially taking advantage of low cost students to keep science thriving. Yep. That is a big thing. All of these effects add up to a growing dissatisfaction within science and a significant burnout. A oh yeah. Holy cow. Nature, which is conducted every year found that less than 60% of respondents reported being satisfied. Thank you, Kiwi Kame, for the, uh, the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Their position. Hang on. 60% of respondents, which is conducted every year, found that less than 60% of respondents reported being satisfied with their position. Now, so these are people who had time to take a survey and everything, too. Um, but yeah, fewer than 60% of scientists... I thought that they were being, you know, paid what they were worth or were happy in their jobs. This is crazy because as a scientist, I mean, doing science is what you're passionate about. So these are people who already have attained, like, they've already made it in the sense that they have a job in the sciences. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is because of the pandemic. I'm very funny harass. <laughs> everyone found difficult. But it seems that science was hit harder than industry. Yep. The survey found. Uh, MLS says, isn't that true of most industries right now? I mean, here you go. That 58% of academics' level of satisfaction with their work had decreased from the year prior. Yep. Which compares to only 44% in industry. One academic noted... As a profession, we have gotten into the position where we work every night. We read theses, we review journals, we sit on grant review panels, yep. all for free. So these are all things that we have to volunteer to do or get voluntold. We don't get paid to, to publish scientific papers. We don't get paid to review scientific papers or to sit on committees or to do any of the other stuff. And oftentimes that's outside of normal work hours too. As a scientist, at least in this system, you can't leave your work at work if you're in academia. If you're in industry, then you can. 
there's a different kind of culture there in industry. In academia, you're expected to work many, many hours at home for free outside of your day job. And, and people tell you, well, if you don't do that, you're not going to get ahead in science, you know? You're not getting enough papers published. Like, your prestige is falling. You, you know, you got it's It's like this toxic kind of grind set mentality, you know? Basically, we have two full-time jobs. Yeah. The survey reflects this position, with nearly one-third of respondents reported working more than 50 hours per week. Yeah. Jeez. The report goes on to say that working weeks of more than 50 hours were twice as common in academia when compared to industry. Yep, so, there you go. Is there a better method? Well, one idea would be to have a lottery system. Basically, grant <laughs> reviews are good at ruling out bad research. Yeah. They are just not good at separating the good from the great. So, in this proposal, Rather than trying to find the best research, they would try to remove bad research from the pool and then let the lottery system decide who gets the grants. I think this is a fantastic idea. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's, also, it's already very similar to like peer review and how that works, maybe. Yeah. This could have multiple advantages particularly if it yeah. reduced the time required to write the grants in the first place. But this is a hard sell. When people get grants, they are likely to assume it is because they deserved it, not because of some luck, even if, on average, it is... I don't know. In my experience, people who have actually gotten grants, sometimes they go like, I don't even know how I got this. I absolutely thought I never would. Maybe it's that I'm talking to a lot of early career researchers. And, you know, they're not narcissists or people like that. They've got a little bit of imposter syndrome and, they, and they, they ask themselves, how could I ever have gotten this in the first place? I'm so incredibly lucky. This feels like luck. But yeah. It's likely that luck played a role. Yeah. So unfortunately, we probably won't see a large overhaul of the grant process anytime soon. No, probably not. In the end, we waste significant money and time on writing grants. If successful, we waste more time with pointless administration. The grant process itself isn't fair, and it doesn't reflect the quality of the research, and it doesn't reflect True. the outcome. So, not great overall. If you like this video, you might also like this video where I discuss whether or not you can trust science YouTubers. <laughs> I'm going to subscribe to this guy. Good stuff. I'll check out some more of his videos later. Here's a link in the chat if you want to check this out. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so science funding is in a bad way, especially here in the United States. And this whole grant writing paradigm that we're in, this whole system that's in place right now, in part, this is because of the space race. In part, this is because of Sputnik 1, launched on this day in 1957. So, let's talk about how that happened here, shall we? And was there a name for the alternate process he described? Uh, like a lottery system, MLF? Yeah. Yeah. Um, HD says, we just get ChatGPT to write the grants and ChatGPT to review the grants. Problem solved. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> and then we award the, the, the grants to ChatGPT as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh... And Kennedy says, for a great story about imposter syndrome and the space race, Google Neil Gaiman's story about imposter syndrome. You know, I'm tempted to do that right now. 
Uh. Yeah. Hi, highly relatable anecdote about Neil Armstrong is actually true. Well, well, well. Uh. Some years ago. I was lucky enough to be invited to a gathering of great and good people, artists and scientists, writers, and discoverer of things, as I felt that at any moment they would realize that I didn't qualify to be there among these people who had really done things. On my second or third night there, X, oh boy, ugh. Um, on my second or third night there, I was standing at the back of the hall while a musical entertainment happened. This is written in a bizarre way. And I start, started talking to a very nice, polite, elderly gentleman about several things, including our shared first name. And then he pointed to the hall of people and said words to the effect of, I just look at all these people and think, what the heck am I even doing here? They've made amazing things. I just went where I was sent. And I said, yes, but you were the first man on the moon. I think that counts for something. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that is a great story. And apparently... That's true, okay. Um, yeah. So that is imposter syndrome. This idea that, like, oh, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not good enough. My work isn't good enough to be here, and it's honestly something that a lot of scientists, especially younger scientists, feel. Especially younger scientists who might come from kind of a lower socioeconomic class. If you grew up working class, you know, if you had to work several jobs, try and pay your way through college, stuff like that, you kind of understand on some level that, like, this world wasn't built for you in the same way that it was literally built for people who come from wealth. And that... That can really inflame imposter syndrome. I think everybody might have a little bit of this, unless they're, like, a raging narcissist. But, yeah, for people who come from humbler backgrounds, it's, uh... It could be particularly pronounced. So interesting that Neil Armstrong felt the same way. And Neil Gaiman. Uh, um, because if Neil Armstrong felt like an imposter, maybe everyone did. Maybe there weren't any grown-ups. Only people who had worked hard and also got lucky or were slightly out of their depth. All of us just doing the best job we could, which is all we can really hope for. I like that. I like that. Thank you, Kennedy. Yeah. And thank you for the hydrate there, AQ. Author Neil Stevenson was also in the three Neil conversation. Is that right, Kennedy? Interesting. <laughs> uh, Rothgar says, I used to have imposter syndrome. I have since realized that I'm not good enough to have it. <laughs> Boy, Rothgar. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad it all worked out in the end. Yeah. Here, before we get into the video with, um, Sean Otto talking about Sputnik and talking about science funding in the U.S., talking about how that helped lead to the bad situation that we're in right now with science funding. Let's check on our 3D printer real quick. And check on... This is the final piece of the coelacanth that is currently printing. We will be assembling the coelacanth live on stream tomorrow, so I hope you're excited for that. I know I'm excited. Yeah. Good stuff. Again, for anybody wondering, like, what are we talking about here? Let me show you. This model of the coelacanth is what I'm printing, except I'm printing it significantly larger than this. Coelacanth is in a a really important creature. It is very closely related to the 
uh, the Sarcopterygian fishes that gave rise to creatures like us. So this is pretty close to our ancient fishy ancestors. And the coelacanth in particular is a really cool story because coelacanth fishes had been known from fossils for a really long time. Uh, you know, since like the mid-1800s or maybe earlier. Really cool fishes, and then they, they kind of disappear from the fossil record. It was assumed that they went extinct at the same time as the dinosaurs. And then in 1938, Marjorie Courtney Latimer in New London, South Africa, she discovered... A, not a live one. It was very recently dead, but it had been alive. Um, There, in the flesh. So, yeah. Yeah. This is the head of the animal right here. I've got all the other pieces printed, print, printed already, except for the one that's currently on the printer. We'll be assembling all of it on tomorrow's stream. Yeah, this is going really well. I'm printing the, the right pectoral fin here. So that's um, this fin right here. That's the last piece. Yeah. Anyway, coelacanth. Pretty cool critter. And you could even download this yourself and print your own if you want to. Yeah. Check it out. Golganek, thank you again for your uh, support sending me those, uh, those two whole spools of printer filament. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Let me make sure I'm not going to run out of filament on this spool, too. Hang on. Hang on a sec. No, we're good. We're good. Excellent. Uh, oh, and Lenina, you printed your own seal account? Let's take a look at that, shall we? Well, 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 very nice. Oh, that looks beautiful, Lenina. And you printed it in this really nice, like, translucent color. That's gorgeous. Yeah, so this is the, the fin that I'm printing right now. Very nice, Lenina. Very, very nice. That is lovely. Check that out. Very nice. And wow, this is a big image. Highly detailed. Very cool, Lenina. And look at those beautiful fins. Those fleshy Sarcopterygian fins. Which, in relatives, close relatives of the coelacanth, they evolved into limbs, giving rise to limbed vertebrate animals like you and me. Pretty neat. Charlie's Dragon says the smoky resin makes it look sort of ethereal and fantasy-esque in the best way. Isn't that cool? The joys of 3D printing. Really neat. Really neat. Uh, uh, cool stuff. Cool stuff. Now... If we're talking about science funding, we're talking about Sputnik, let's tie it all together with this author right here giving a talk. We were reading that passage from his book earlier, The War on Science, Sean Otto, book I'd recommend. Let's check this out. Broader narrative line of U.S. politics and see why people feel the way they do, because a lot of it is an emotional reaction in the public. And it used to be about 100 years ago that science was quickly commercialized in the form of new technology. It was a creation, a job creator, drove a lot of economic development, created fortunes, and it was a big source of American pride. But after, at the end of World War II, our attitude towards science really transformed uh, after we dropped the atomic bomb. Yeah. There were um, yeah, the film... Uh Oppenheimer, 
if any of you saw that, kind of deals with these themes. Um, yeah, I saw that with iOS about a month ago. Um, yeah, it was entertaining. Not my favorite movie, but uh, yeah, yeah, it made me sure glad that paleontology isn't one of those sciences where. Or we have to wonder if we're responsible for horrible atrocities committed uh, based on the work that we do. There were a lot of moral and ethical discussions at the time about whether we'd become technological giants and moral and ethical infants. And there was a sense that science and the industri scientific industrial uh, military complex had uh, outgrown our ability to uh, control our impulses. But that negative view began to switch very quickly in 1957 with the advent of Sputnik. Yep. And suddenly, uh, eight years after the Soviets had exploded their atomic bomb, uh, we were vulnerable because maybe it's possible that they might put one in space shortly and drop them on us. So suddenly, through the, because of this military reason, Americans felt themselves in a space race and that really meant a science race to really understand how to do yep. this, how to control space, but also all the, the research that was necessary that was an offshoot of that. After I wonder if, give me just a second here. I think I vaguely recall a little video about science education in the 50s. We were kind of talking about this yesterday with like googie architecture and the optimism of the 1950s and early 1960s. And uh, uh, is this the one I'm thinking of? This was produced later. In 1950, American scientists were perfecting color television, tranquilizers, and Xerox copying machines. Amateur inventors all over the world were creating gadgets galore to make our lives easier and more fun. There was the radio-controlled golf caddy. This is all pretty quaint. Not really the sort of thing I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about, like, just this concerted effort to really, really focus on science education in the 1950s. Um, suddenly, science education was valued very, very highly. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Um, but that's okay. After World War II, a guy named Vannevar Bush had proposed peacetime funding of science and technology by the government in a paper called Science is important. Endless Frontier. And he made the argument that if we did that, like we had done during World War II, America would become the preeminent power because science and technology created power, new knowledge, and it would drive our economy forward. And he was... Uh, Claire explained it much better with more details as Charlie's Dragon. Oh, never mind. Right. After Sputnik, all these different government science agencies were funded, NSF, NIH, all of them, and we began seeing this new era of government science that was... Yeah, big science, as it's often been called. You're right, Caravan, yes, but this had its own pitfalls, which he's going to talk about. Producing dizzyingly quick uh, breakthroughs. But at the same time that we entered that science race, scientists themselves pulled themselves out of the public dialogue. Yes. Up until that point, scientists had had to go out to speak to standing room only crowds of people about their new discoveries. This was fascinating, but also ginned up support from the public to fund their research. Yep. Well, now that they had public dollars, they felt we have to be responsible with this money because if we fund something that's stupid, we're going to get a black eye and we're, we're going to get defunded. So they set up these panels of scientists who would judge other scientists' grant uh, proposals. 
we talked all about the whole grant, you know, uh, system a few but minutes ago. They forgot about that public engagement piece. Yeah. And this link between the public and the scientists that they were supporting began to atrophy. Mm -hmm. In 1962, uh, that transformed into worry about science with the publication of Silent Spring. The idea yep. that chemicals rapidly commercialized after World War II were now in the environment and they could be destroying the environment and destroying our health too. The creation of environmental science and the environmental movement mm -hmm. uh, happened after the uh, publication of that book. At about the same time, we were having a big moral and ethical discussion over the growing human control of the reproductive cycle. Uh, there was discussion back then, uh, particularly by... I don't uh, really know a lot about this. ...over whether or not test tube babies, as they were called back then, we now call them in vitro fertilization, whether they would have souls like everybody else. So this kind of moral questioning and ethical uh, divide over, over these two issues, the biological sciences and the environmental sciences, created a split in American politics. Anyway, this is not really what we're focused on here, but what he was talking about earlier, you know, suddenly scientists did not have to go out hat in hand to the public and say, here's my research, this is really cool, will you support this? If they had basically kind of unlimited support, you know, not unlimited support, but they had a lot of support from the federal government, and they, and many times, were actually told explicitly do not talk to the public about your work do not engage the public this stuff is classified or your time is better spent not going out to the public you know we're going to set up this whole granting system everything else it it really kind of set us up for failure nowadays especially when that funding dried up after the cold war when federal funding of science plummeted this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important for scientists to to do outreach on platforms like Twitch. One of the things that I really, really like about Twitch is that many of the people who are watching right now are not necessarily people who realize that they were interested in science until maybe they stumbled across this channel. Um... It's kind of the opposite of speaking to the choir, you know? It is true outreach. Many of you probably have backgrounds that are not in the sciences. Um, many of you probably grew up not particularly liking science in school. Probably because it wasn't taught well or it just I don't know, wasn't presented in an interesting way. Part of what I'm trying to do here is... reach some folks who never realized that science is really, really cool. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, and Caravan made an interesting point here, too, about scientists as the new priesthood. Again, that's the sort of idea that I'm trying to push back against here. But this was a thing in the 1950s and 60s. Scientists were seen as this... I don't know. Sputnik goes up. Americans are terrified. We need to get serious about this science thing, American leaders said. Suddenly, scientists are given resources that they didn't have before. They're given prestige that they didn't have before. They're told, go back to your laboratories and help us win this Cold War. And it's almost like scientists were seen at the time as... I don't know. Wizards or something like that. It's like, oh, don't worry about talking to the public. Don't worry about making your work relatable to the public. Just work on this stuff so we can beat the Russians and... Hold yourself up in the laboratory. Just produce results. Now going back to the book here.
Where was that quote that I was looking for here? Um... Here we go. By this time, it was clear that science was the answer to the twin threats of the uh, twin threats of the arms race and Sputnik, and that America was, in fact, in a science race. It's the same phrase that Sean Otto used there. As Vannevar Bush had essentially argued in Science, the Endless Frontier, science had become one of the primary weapons in a new kind of war. The nation that invested the most in science and engineering research and development would lead the world and perhaps find safety. In the span of two short decades, science had attained sacred cow status, enjoyed by few other federal priorities. Gone were the days of scientists needing to reach out to wealthy benefactors to justify and explain their work in order to get funding, or indeed to reach out to the public in general and say, hey, things like the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, etc. are important and we need to fund those. Like, talk to your representatives, let's get this funded. That wasn't going on, because that funding was already coming from those agencies through the federal government. Over the course of a single generation, government funding allowed scientists to turn inward, away from the public, and toward their lab benches. At the very time that the public had developed a love-hate relationship with science. This love-hate relationship came with the conflicting emotions of need and resentment. Through their work, uh, though their work is by nature anti-authoritarian, yeah, anti-authoritarian, and somewhat artistic, scientists became figures of authority in white lab coats. Bland, dry, value-neutral, and above the fray. This new image of science, implanted in the baby boomers by hundreds of classroom film strips, couldn't have been less inspiring or further from the truth. Scientists are often very passionate and curious, interested in many things, they are often world travelers and lovers of the outdoors and the arts. These are the very qualities that typically motivate their interest in science, the exploration of the natural world, to begin with. But very little of that characteristic passion and curiosity would be communicated to the general public for the next 50 years. Science can be regarded as a culture of monks, intellectual, quietly cloistered, creatively dry. With tax money pouring in from a vastly expanded economy and the public respect afforded the authority of the white lab coat, two generations of scientists instead had only to impress their own university departments and government agencies to keep research funds coming their way. They no longer had to impress the public, which was growing increasingly mistrustful of science. That is what I'm trying to avoid here, you know? The whole point of paleontologizing, the whole point of these broadcasts, of this channel, is to bring science to you at home and to answer your questions and just talk about how cool this stuff is. And I hope I'm doing a good job of that, you know? So yeah. Anyway. Great job. Caravan, I appreciate you. Thank you. No. Well, that having been said, I actually have some more emails to send out tonight. I've got some science to do. I gotta wrap this up. So let's go ahead and start our wrap-up procedure here, shall we? Here we go. We're gonna find somebody else to raid here. And, uh... Gonna go try and uh, get a little bit of work done. Thank you to everybody whose names are gonna show up here in the chat. Or in the chat, in the credits. Ugh. Thank you for your support. Thanks for 
helping me do this. You know? It's, uh... I really appreciate it. This would not be possible without you. We are not going to raid into Monterey Bay Aquarium. Shoot, because they their stream ends in four minutes, three minutes. Let's go see what uh, I Paint Burbs is up to, maybe. How long has she been going? And thank you, anonymous user. I appreciate that. Good stuff. Um, we're gonna go check out I Paint Burbs uh, as maybe an early Thursday Birds Day celebration. Thursday Birds Day is tomorrow. I hope <coughs> you'll join me for that chat. It's gonna be a good one. We're gonna be assembling our coelacanth tomorrow as well. Don't miss it. But right now, let's uh, let's go check out I Paint Burbs. I'll see you there. Bye bye.